Good morning, everybody. Well, we're ready to start off an exciting day. Uh, welcome, my name is Carol Kashub, and I'm the, mem I'm the Member Relations and Business Manager at Better Health Partnership. I am proud to say that I've been with Better Health Partnership since it started way back in 2007. This is really an exciting day. Our first learning collaborative, for those of you that don't know or it's been a while, was way back on September 28, 2007 at the Learning Exchange at the Lewis Stokes Cleveland VA Medical Center facility in Cleveland. Then we held learning collaboratives at the Cleveland Clinic, the TRW Building in Lyndhurst. Our learning collaboratives grew, we needed more space, and then we went to corporate college. Well, it's been a while, but today we're here in the Zoom in the new virtual world. Even though we so miss having that in-person feeling, seeing and talking with old friends and colleagues and meeting everyone uh, at lunch and breaks and in the hall, it's still great to see everybody virtually. I remember when the main thing I had to worry about in the morning was, was there gonna be a blizzard? That's happened. People stuck in traffic as of an accident. Well, you know, that happens at 271 and now, look what we have to worry about. I'm so hoping that next year, our next learning collaborative will be in person. Next slide. Um, right now, everybody's phone, everybody's sound is muted. And um, so I ask if you would please keep it that way, um, at least for the duration of this uh, talk. And please submit your questions through the chat window. Uh, presentations and the recording of today will be posted on our website. Um, I also, on here, I missed it on this slide. Of, and this, we are asking to put your view on speaker view so you can see the speakers at, and who is talking at that time. Next slide, please. I want to thank the awesome Better Health Partnership team. There's Al, Kirsten, Jonathan, Dee Dee, Marie, Chris, Keith, Dave, Rita, Chuck, I'll thank myself too, I guess. But speaking for all of them, we wanna thank you for being here today. Next slide, please. I also wanna thank our wonderful panelists and presenters who have had to read and answer so many of my email requests, plus take time to have group phone calls to plan their sessions and to put their presentations together. Thank you for everything. And I am looking forward to all of your presentations today. Without all of you, today's event would not have been possible. I also wanna thank our Better Health Partnership members. Thank you for being here and for your kind support. We at Better Health Partnership, I give, give the sincerest thank you to all of you for being here today, cutting time out of your busy schedules. Next slide, please. I wanna thank Stacy Donahue. She's Senior Director from the Civitas Network, on October 1st, Henry and Strategic Health Information Collaborative have affiliated as one organization. Civitas is a national network of health improvement collaboratives that also share best practices and unify at state and national levels on innovative opportunities to help bring greater health value to our partners and to the region. Better Health Partnership is proud to say that we are members of this national network of health improvement collaboratives. Thank you, Savitas, and thank you, Stacy. She's behind the scene here, advancing our slides for helping us out today. Next slide, please. Next is my friend, my colleague, someone I've known for a while, Dr. Donald Ford. Um, he is going to be your MC today, and take it away, Donald. Thank you so much, Carol, and uh, I share my thanks uh, to all that you have mentioned. Um, uh, we, we have such a great partnership, such a great group of people contributing. Um, we, are, uh, we are certainly not um, uh, put at pause by the fact that we have to work remotely now. Uh, of course, we hope we can be back in, in person soon, but uh, I think we've actually gotten pretty good at this. Um, that said, this is a bittersweet moment for me. Uh, I have uh, announced this privately to our group. Uh, but I've had the honor of being the chief medical officer for Better Health Partnership for the last four years. And just, uh, just this year, I have been offered a position to take over as chair of family medicine at Cleveland Clinic. I'm deeply honored to have been offered this. 
Um, I also work on a group called the Board of Governors at Cleveland Clinic. And unfortunately, because of those obligations that I'm taking on now, I've had to step down uh, from my role as chief medical officer. So this will be my last learning collaborative in that role. Uh, I, I say that uh, it's, it's in that role because I fully intend to continue the partnership that we've had for so many years. Cleveland Clinic was a founding member of Better Health Partnership. Um, we've been able to, uh, to work together over many years in many different fashions and functions with many of our different individuals. Uh, to really further the goals of, of better health partnership in terms of enhancing the health of the community. And I think the developments that we're, uh, we're taking at Cleveland Clinic now in terms of, of pivoting our view from being purely a specialty organization to being one that sits in the community and has an obligation to the health of the community, I think we'll continue our partnership in ways that, that are are going to be important in the future. And I hope to be part of that uh, sitting as chair of family medicine. The leadership opportunities that I've had through Better Health Partnership are really meaningful to me. Um, I will mention one opportunity that I've had to learn. Uh, it sounds strange as I, I've been trained as a, a servant leader throughout my career. Uh, I understand that, you know, it's not, it's, 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 it's an inverted triangle that the strength of the organization sits at the top at the wide part of the triangle. Um, the work with Better Health Partnership has really taught me how important collaboration is. It's not that as a leader, I assume a position of power and then I'm able to leverage that power to get people to do what I want. It's that through collaboration, through identifying and inviting like-minded people to the table, solutions can be found that are better than any leader could have found on their own. And, and that's a lesson that we've lived every single day at Better Health Partnership. And I am deeply grateful to the, the staff, to the board of trustees, and to all the partners of Better Health Partnership for allowing me to participate in that learning. Next slide, please. We've been working together since 2007 to collectively impact health and health disparities. You see a number of our great partners here, uh, some dynamic people we've had a, a tremendous opportunity to work with, and some of them are gonna be talking with you today. Um, we've demonstrated the widely recognized collective impact on health and health disparities in Northeast Ohio. Next slide, please. And this picture was taken at our last in-person learning collaborative. And, uh, and I, I share the nostalgia that, that Carol discussed, uh, how, how much we'd love to be back in person and we hope to be back in person in the coming months and years. Uh, this was this just represents the the warmth and celebration that, that we have of getting together. Um, we do it today on Zoom, uh, but but our hearts are all there together with everybody. Sharing the vision of Better Health Partnership, we envision being the region's most trusted health improvement collaborative that achieves exceptional health value and eradicates health disparities in Northeast Ohio and our mission to bring healthcare providers, social services, and other sectors together to share best practices and accelerate data-informed improvements in equitable population and community health. Next slide, please. So how on earth can we do that? Collaboration is key. Our partners have proudly delivered evidence-based solutions derived from actionable analytics, resulting in sustainable system level positive change for the community. We are member and partner led. We are data informed and we are improvement focused. And if we keep those principles in mind, we found that anything is possible. Next slide, please. And this slide demonstrates how we look at the map of our strategic priorities. How do we align with our mission? We engage in healthcare delivery system improvement. We work with our partners on a practice level and a system level to try to provide best practices, uh, discover the work that's being done and to align people towards health improvement. We work in the community health impact initiatives 
and we work in the social determinant of health in, uh, in interventions, particularly, uh, I think the standout of the last uh, few years work that we've done at Better Health Partnership is the development of the Pathways Hub, which we've shared on a number of occasions uh, with, with all of our partners. So together, these focus on the overlap of equitable population and community health, as you see in our diagram. And this is how we achieve our mission. Next slide, please. I'd like to take a minute just to go over the agenda for this morning. Um, we're, we're starting out with a presentation by Dr. Sherry Bolin about cardio, sharing the best practices to achieve outstanding cardiovascular and diabetes health outcomes for all Ohioans. These are important clinical areas where we understand that the impact of disequity in healthcare is the strongest, where, where it, it seems almost like low-hanging fruit to, to try to fix that problem, but you'll see in the presentation how much work has gone in to trying to address that. I'm going to be moderating a panel discussion uh, about the Woodhill neighborhood transformation. We have some marvelous partners who are going to share with you their work, their vision for the transformation of this important Cleveland neighborhood. We'll share with you Better Health Partnership updates. And we're going to share two the work from two groups from Better Health Partnership. Uh, you'll see that the structure that we follow, we, we have to divide and conquer some of our work. And so we've got a presentation from our adult leadership team to talk about specific addressing racial disparities and chronic disease. And then we'll also hear from a group that we've worked with who are addressing climate change and health and how that can have an impact on the equity of health in our, in our communities. And we'll finish up with uh, some recognition and celebration through our gold star recognition to our partners who have been working so hard through the pandemic to, to improve the health of our neighbors in our community. Next slide, please. And I'd like to share with you this video. This is from the Health Anchor Network, a national coalition consisting of 60 health systems who are working together to an advance an anchor mission approach which means leveraging the economic and human capital of these organizations within their institutions and within the communities they serve. And I think this summarizes the relationship well between the, the importance of social determinants of health, the health partners that we have and the community work that's being done. We can go ahead and play the video. When people think of hospitals, we hope they think of care. We care about every person who comes through those doors. We care about their health. We care about positive outcomes. And we work hard to achieve them. But the reality is, if someone is walking through our doors, in many cases, we're responding too late. We react to the disease, the ailment, or the emergency. And in that moment, we can only care for the individual. What can we do to care? right now for an entire community. Right outside our doors, neighborhoods suffer from their own ailments. Poverty and unemployment take a direct toll on our community's health. Studies have shown that half of health outcomes result from social, environmental, and economic factors. Half. Your income and zip code can be a better predictor of your health outcomes than the quality of care you have access to. If we're truly committed to care, then it's time to do the most good we can by investing in our communities. Because the reality is, our mission to care doesn't stop at our doors. Instead, we can bring our community in by buying from the businesses that surround us. Farmers, contractors, local manufacturers, they can provide us with the goods and services our hospital needs to run. And there are many talented, local people we can hire to work with us here on site, creating jobs and a chance to build a career. Then we can push out into the community by investing in the things that our community needs to thrive, like affordable housing. It's not a cure, it's just care. Taking an active interest in those around us, building equity by creating more opportunities for more people. Then. Instead of just chasing health crises, we can contribute to more positive outcomes.
both in and out of the hospital. Those are more of the smiles we like to see. Those are more of the stories we like to tell. Care. It feels good. Well, thank you for sharing that video with us. And uh, I hope that sets the tone. Uh, these, these seem like insurmountable obstacles at times. And I think you'll learn from today's present presentations and discussion that with hard work, intelligent and creative solutions and true partnership, we can really overcome these. I have the great honor of uh, introducing my friend and colleague, Dr. Sherry Bolin. She's an associate professor of medicine, Case Western Reserve University in Metro Health. And she is the co-principal investigator for the Ohio Cardiovascular and Diabetes Health Collaborative, known as Cardio. Dr. Bolin. Great, thank you, uh, Donald, for that warm introduction. And I'm uh, very enthusiastic and excited to be here today to talk with all of you about our statewide collaborative. Um, and uh, I don't know if I'm just going to say next slide and hopefully the magic will happen. <laughs> Great, thank you. So today I'm going to discuss some um, cardiovascular health in Ohio briefly. Um, I'll describe cardio's activities to improve cardiovascular health and reduce disparities and identify ways um, you can get engaged with cardio, if not already. Next slide. So this is a map of the United States that I came across a few years ago and had not seen before, um, but it looks at heart attack and stroke rates across the different states in the United States. And really Ohio, uh, unfortunately, is in the top quartile of states for those um, heart attacks and stroke events. So we really have um, a real uh, reason to sort of focus on cardiovascular health in Ohio in particular because of where we are. Uh, across the US. Next slide. And just in terms of what we have in Ohio and our focus on Ohio, we really have some really modifiable risk factors. So we have 35% of Ohioans have high blood pressure, 21% are smokers, and 11% uh, of Ohioans have diabetes. And so there's a real opportunity to help control these um, conditions and prevent them as a way of reducing our cardiovascular risk. And disparities exist. You know, we talked a little bit, uh, I guess the uh, video sort of focused a little bit on that as well, but we have higher rates of uncontrolled high blood pressure, uncontrolled diabetes and cardiovascular disease events among black and Hispanic populations compared with whites in Ohio. We have greater hypertension and diabetes prevalence in the rural and urban areas compared with suburban settings. And smoking rates are higher in geographic areas with lower socioeconomic factors. Next slide. And the, this is a, just showing a map of Ohio where it, they've ranked the counties within Ohio. And so there's 88 counties in Ohio. And the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, does these county health rankings looking at length of life and quality of life. And just what you can see in this map is um, highlighting some of what I said in the last slide, that the urban and rural settings tend to have worse health outcomes. And that's also for cardiovascular health outcomes. And you can see that Cuyahoga County um, is also one of those areas where we need to really focus and that there, we have some uh, work to do. Next slide. And uh, I'm not trying to test your visions. I know this, this uh, text is really small and I will read through this, but um, this is a, a slide that um, came out of an article and Dr. Joshua Joseph, who is at Ohio State and part of our cardio collaborative worked on this article. But it, if we're gonna talk about disparities, it is important to recognize the historical discrimination and racism that led to some of these disparities that exist today. And so that is really what this slide um, sort of outlines and it's just examples. But on the left, 
There's been medical and scientific contributors to this, um, such as the closure of medical schools that were training black physicians in the 1910s. Um, many of you are familiar with experimentation that happened on vulnerable groups without their consent. And those kinds of um, co you know, contributions have led to decreased trust in the medical establishment, um, has led to healthcare provider bias toward minority patients. Um, and some of these have led to language and communication barriers. And on the right-hand side of this slide are, are looking at social conditions and policies. And I know BetterHealth has talked about this at other, at other times and at other collaboratives, but the issue of redlining and predatory lending that led to um, racial residential segregation and housing insecurity, certainly the inadequate investment to maintain public works and school systems in minority neighborhoods, and discrimination and access to high quality jobs with adequate health insurance are some contributors that have led to structural and institutional racism. And all of those factors have really led to these issues around healthcare context and physical context that were just mentioned, sort of decreased access to healthy food, decreased neighborhood stability and cleanliness, decreased affordable housing, as well as poor access to care, decreased quality of care, um, less shared decision-making and patient provider relationships and uh, low health literacy. And so those, all of those things combined have led to um, increased stress and, and other mechanisms that have led to increased blood pressure, obesity, cholesterol, and elevated blood sugar, which led to disparities in these cardiovascular health outcomes. So I know Donald mentioned, well, this is sort of an overwhelming slide. You know, how do we all address not just this slide, but the prior slides, all of that to, um, to really improve outcomes and uh, eliminate disparities. So in the next slide, and I do think that collaboratives can improve cardiovascular health and reduce disparities. I'll show some examples of that. Um, regional and statewide efforts and quality improvement activities are often fragmented. Um, just think about your own organization or health system or even community setting and how so many different activities are happening. And we often don't even know about those activities, which, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But if you can imagine a bunch of people, um, as I have in this figure here or this photo rowing, and if everybody's rowing, even if they're rowing in the same stream and trying to go the same direction, if everybody's sort of rowing a little bit off kilter, you're just not going to have the same impact that if I know about what you're doing and you know about what I'm doing, how can we really align those activities and partner together so when we row together like these rowers are doing, we can have that really efficient uh, rowing technique and really have a greater impact together. So I do think um, coordinated collaboratives can have a really strong impact on cardiovascular outcomes as we think about aligning together. Next slide. And many of you have seen this before, um, but Better Health Partnership in 2014 and 15 took on work to try and improve blood pressure control across our region. Um, I was a part of that along with many others um, on the call today. And really looking at uh, working with primary care clinics that um, were had worse blood pressure control and how we could improve that together. And working together, we were really able to improve blood pressure control from around 66% of uh, patients being under good control to 75% being under good control. If you look by insurance, we almost eliminated the gap and disparity in blood pressure control be between uninsured Medicaid and Medicare and commercial insured. Uh, by race ethnicity, we almost completely eliminated the disparity between Hispanic and white um, populations in blood pressure control. And while we reduced the disparity in Africa between African American and white, we did not eliminate that. So that's an opportunity for continued improvement and how do we partner and really improve these outcomes. Next slide. And then in 2017, uh, the Ohio Department of Medicaid funded Case Western Reserve University to really um, develop a statewide cardiovascular health collaborative focused on, uh, and our mission was really to improve cardiovascular and now diabetes health outcomes and eliminate disparities in Ohio's Medicaid population. Really linked together all seven medical schools across the state, but of course, partnering with others beyond the medical schools. And we identify, produce, and disseminate evidence-based cardiovascular and diabetes best practices to primary care teams. And we use our monthly newsletters, our online website with uh, lots of resources, our podcasts that are now available monthly, 
um, and some case-based learning training models um, where we have primary care teams join virtually to discuss cases to try and improve health. Uh, we did have annual statewide conferences which have been on hold for a, a bit and then uh, virtual webinars. Next slide. And this is just um, showing the leadership across the different universities that have been, <clears throat> excuse me, partnering together to work on this collaborative. Next slide. And this are our six amazing team and team leadership to really produce the content and the work. Under team best practices, we probably have about 50 people from across the state that work to produce the content um, and all of the um, work that, that we have. So uh, thanks to all of those teams. Uh, next slide. And, um, and also Better Health Partnership has been a part of our collaborative as well. So uh, another great reason to have us uh, on today. This is our website, which is looking at um, where we have our best practices. Next slide. And we have, um, I won't spend a lot of time on the slide, but just we have about 58 different resources on our website um, as fact sheets in a number of different areas. And you can see those here. Um, we have um, videos of our echo didactics, which are our um, sort of 10 to 15 minute lectures on different topics around cardiovascular health. We have our 17 podcasts and capsules and then currents. And I'm going to just briefly highlight some examples of each of these categories, um, just a few, because you can go to our website and, and explore more. Next slide. <clears throat> so this is just one example. Our um, Social Determinants of Health Working Group worked on developing a website document around what are available screening tools that um, primary care teams could use to identify social needs. And so this just describes some of those different screening tools um, so folks can decide what, what to use and uh, how to use them. Next slide. Coming soon, <clears throat> we have a document on the hub pathways models across the state. Um, Donald, I think mentioned that earlier, that Better Health has been a part of that. And this is uh, showing the spread of those across the state, but that you can identify a patient with um, health related social needs and refer them to a community health worker or to the hub pathway who will assign a community health worker to work uh, to try and address those concerns. Next slide. This is a structure of our echo clinic, um, but we basically have a 10 minute sort of topic presentation. And then we have two cases that are presented from the primary care teams and different from a typical sort of learning scenario where we focus on solely medical treatment. Um, we focus on medical treatment here, but we also talk about how do we engage patients in care and how do we address social determinants of health and mental health. So it's a bit broader than just sort of a medical, you know, medication treatment and lifestyle treatment. Next slide. This is an example of our capsules, which we push out monthly. Again, the type uh, is very uh, tiny here. I don't expect you to read this, but this is around home blood pressure monitoring and practical instructions for patients. It's one of our most downloaded capsules, um, really useful for patients that are having transportation issues, but we obviously want to do home blood pressure monitoring for a lot of other reasons as well. Um, and we have lots of uh, ways to, um, implement this on our website that are really useful and practical for primary care clinics. Next slide. We started a Currents, which is just a monthly uh, blurb on a particular article that has come out that might be useful to primary care clinics. So this is uh, one that was on community health workers in telehealth and improving blood sugar levels in patients with diabetes um, so that people could see what's uh, out there and what they might want to emulate. Next slide. And this is looking at our podcast. We have uh, now 17 of these, but I'll just highlight uh, a couple. One is the addressing the quadruple aim in healthcare, which Dr. Peter Protovost from UH, actually uh, University of Hospitals uh, recorded with us, which has got our, a, a lot of listeners and actually has more than that now. We have uh, a disparities in cardiovascular disease and diabetes implications for practice that Dr. Joshua Joseph in Ohio State worked on, and then a hypertension management in the era of telehealth and, and lots more. So we encourage you to go. These are fun to listen to while you're driving, um, if you're driving to work. So it's a, a good uh, opportunity to listen to these. Next slide. 
This is just showing our spread across Ohio um, for people that have gone to our website and used it. So we are getting a lot of use across the state. We're in a little bit of competition between Cleveland and Columbus for the most users, as you can see here. Um, but we're really excited with the reach that we have and we uh, continue to work on that. Next slide. And I, I wanted to also mention, so how Department of Medicaid also funded us to work on a hypertension and now a diabetes quality improvement project with high volume Medicaid practices across the state. And we improved blood pressure control in those practices by 14%, which is fantastic. Um, but you can see still opportunity for greater improvement. Next slide. So this is my summary slide, and then I'm actually gonna still have more slides, so it's a little bit of a trick slide, but um, my other slides will be around ways you could get engaged. Um, this is uh, just sharing that the previous slides, I think have shown that Cardio has grown over the last four years since we started, has successfully engaged with a number of wonderful stakeholders. We use multiple modalities to reach people, which has seemed to work really well. Um, we do know that improving hypertension control and sustaining improvements is possible in diverse clinic settings, including those serving high proportions of disadvantaged populations, and that quality improvement coaching or practice facilitation in the context of a collaborative, both regional, like Better Health Partnership, or across the state with cardio, can have a strong impact. Next slide. So just some ways to get engaged. Um, next slide. We do have an upcoming webinar on the management of type 2 diabetes in the adolescent and young adult. And I want to highlight this because we have two uh, wonderful speakers from University Hospital, Dr. Rose Gubitosi Klug and Dr. Erica Lundgren, who will be presenting. Um, and this is just such a critical area to improve care, um, as well as engaging families in, in improving um, adolescent and young adult type 2 diabetes. It's free CME, and you can register on our website. Next slide. We have some other upcoming webinars. In February, we'll be talking about the use of race and medical guidelines and how uh, what's the emerging practices around that and how do we implement those. In spring, we'll be talking about LGBTQ plus populations and cardiovascular health for that webinar. Um, and we'll have more details as we flesh those out. Next slide. This is our upcoming, we call it our spring tele-echo clinic, although it really does start in winter in January of 20, January 27th to April 14th. It's Thursdays from eight to nine. Its focus will be around weight management and behavior change. Um, there's free CME for this. And this is primary care teams that can join and um, discuss cases. And again, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just medical and lifestyle treatment for weight management, but also focused around social determinants of health and um, how to engage patients in care. And Dr. Gotham Rao from University Hospitals leads this um, particular ECHO series. So um, hope that you're able to join us for some of that. Next slide. And uh, last, I think this is my last slide on ways to engage is we do have a monthly newsletter um, and encourage you to sign up for it if you have interest. This is just, usually we have our monthly capsule, monthly podcast, uh, monthly current that I just mentioned that goes out in the newsletter. Um, but we also had our top five downloads that we sent out recently. Um, the five pearls for motivational interviewing has been one of our highest downloaded uh, topics. So we, we mentioned that. And the other things we send out sometimes in our monthly new newsletter relate to some policy issues. So we had, uh, for instance, I just want everybody to know this, that uh, all the Medicaid managed care plans now cover diabetes self-management education, and that's fairly new in the last few months um, and relates to a lot of work that we did um, talking uh, about how we can enhance diabetes outcomes with Medicaid. So really excited. We mentioned that in one of our newsletters, but I want to get that um, out as well. And then in January, we anticipate that con continuous glucose monitoring will be available without prior authorization. It's currently available for Medicaid fee-for-service. So any of these policy kinds of things we try and also get out in our newsletter um, to folks. So, um, so sign up if you're interested. And then in the next slide, um, oh, there was one more. The heart, we just got funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality to do a Heart Healthy Ohio Quality Improvement Project. So we're working with 60 primary care practices across the state 
on blood pressure and smoking cessation and reducing disparities in those as well. So if you have interest, if you're a primary care practice and you have interest in participating, we actually do still have a few slots open for our April cohort, which we're hoping to finalize in the next week or two. Um, but if you have interest, contact Kathy um, Sullivan at this email, um, or you can reach out, I'm sure, to Carol and she'd get uh, the word to me. Um, next slide. So I will end with this quote. Um, because I think we've talked again about a lot of things that um, take a lot of people working together, but never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So I will let you sort of think about that as we hear all the other um, discussions today. And on the next slide is really just an acknowledgement of all of the um, and of all the folks that really contributed to this work, um, uh, including Better Health um, and Ohio Department of Medicaid. And of course, I need to mention that the views I expressed here are solely my own and do not represent the views of the state of Ohio, any federal Medicaid programs, the CDC, the US Department of Health and Human Services or any other funder. So um, I know time is tight and Donald will probably be trying to move us on to the next presentation. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them in the chat um, and respond that way. And I am um, also happy to connect with, with anyone offline. Thank you, Donald. Thank you, Sherry. Thanks so much for that uh, presentation and for the, for the great work and collaboration that you're doing. We do have a couple of minutes and, and there are a couple of things that came up in the chat. Um, I would invite if people have uh, questions for Dr. Boland, go ahead and, and put them in the chat. We'll try to address as many as we can. Um, there was one comment ab uh, about um, being surprised that Cardio does not address obesity as a disease and a root cause for heart disease and diabetes. You did show the, uh, the slide from the uh, project led by Dr. Rao. Uh, would you care to say any more about that? Yeah, it, it, it's absolutely. Um, I think I mentioned it in the, it was probably in the, um, in one of those, but yeah, and also the case, the case series focused on weight management, but yes, Absolutely. Obesity is um, clearly an upstream factor. We are, um, we've had many discussions, um, probably should be careful about what I say in a, a large forum about um, trying to get better coverage for diabetes prevention program, for instance. Um, but, but yes, th there's clearly a lot of work that needs to be done. And we focus on evidence-based strategies around obesity on our website. Um, and we also have our case series on it, uh, but certainly moving policy levers around that is important as well. And for, for those who are not um, in clinical practice uh, in the group, um, I, I would point out that there really is a revolution in treatment of uh, diabetes, weight, and, um, and heart disease in terms of new medications that are on the market, the SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists. So one question I have is, is there a way to address inequity in pharmaceutical availability? So um, that's a great, a great comment. Um, you know, Cardi, Cardi is a little bit of a, a challenge because the funding stream is through CMS. We're not allowed to do policy work as part of the, the like sort of um, funding. Having said that, I sort of mentioned some of the policy mm -hmm. issues and certainly we all work within health systems that can work on policy. So, so it clearly does come up. Um, so I was on the National Clinical Care Commission where we worked, um, we just submitted something to Congress that they have to act on within 90 days. This is sort of separate from cardio, um, but uh, looking at ways we can um, deal with the cost issue in, in medical um, expenditures. But it's a very important policy issue um, beyond even cardiovascular health, but, but clearly an important one. Um, I, I don't know if I fully answered that yeah. question. <laughs> Well, it's, it, 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 it's helpful to know that that's on the radar. Um, another question from the chat, uh, are local health departments represented in the Cardio Collaborative? Yes, yeah, so we, we do um, engage with Ohio Department of Health. Um, I think the, the way that um, local groups engage with their local health departments is, um, is different, something we've encouraged a lot of engagement from our partner institutions with their local departments of health and have had conversations with many of them. 
Um, so it really just varies across the state. Um, the focus of the funding stream is uh, focused on um, through CMS through to Medicaid providers. And so that is part of the budgetary restrictions, but that doesn't mean that um, cardio can't and uh, doesn't partner with lots of other organizations to do work. So, um, so that you'll see that's sort of the reason there's a focus around the primary care teams is related to the, to the budgetary um, restrictions, but uh, many of us partner with our local departments of health and we continue to try and do that to enhance the work that's happening. Great, and, uh, and one final question, uh, why are there not more African-American providers involved or, or are there? Yeah, I mean, I, I probably just showed the leadership and the um, teams, and I think there's a limited, there's some representation, but it's, it's limited there. I mean, the across the 50, I mean, I'd have to look at our breakdown. We do have um, African-American providers and other providers across the team best practices that I mentioned that has sort of 50 providers across the state. Um, but I think that is certainly open to discussions, Dr. Murphy, on ways to enhance that. So I think um, always looking for, for great ways to do that and, and get out there more. Terrific. Well, thank you so much uh, for, again, for your presentation and for the work that you're doing. And uh, I appreciate your offer. If there are further questions to answer them through the chat, if you're, if you're able to, we'll, we'll get as much as we can on the recording. So thank you very much, Dr. Bolin. Next slide, please. Um, I now have the uh, great privilege of uh, introducing our panel discussion uh, about the Woodhill neighborhood transformation. Now this next session is a, a shining example of the power of collaboration partnership that's happening in the Woodhill neighborhood. Our panelists will share exciting plans for the Buckeye Woodhill neighborhood transformation enabled by a $35 million HUD Choice Grant. Plans include providing high quality mixed income housing, improving employment, income, health, and childhood education for residents. And this is a true model of how to do 21st century urban revitalization. Uh, I will introduce our panelists. Uh, We're going to be hearing from Ms. Marilyn Burns, a community leader advocate and community resident in the Woodhill neighborhood. Ms. Kimelon Dixon, who's a senior project director and uh, for, for Cleveland Purpose Built Communities, which is a partnership of the Cleveland Foundation and St. Luke's Foundation. Also joining us is joining Jody Cunningham, who is the director of health and housing for the community builders. And we're gonna hear more about that. And also Dr. Claude Jones, who's president and chief executive officer for Care Alliance Health Center. So um, I'm eager to start this conversation. Uh, if we could start with uh, Ms. Kimelon Burns. Um, Kimelon, can you please share with us some of the challenges experienced by the Woodhill community, both in the past and in the present, and what, uh, what the partners who are involved, including the purpose-built communities in the transformation effort, efforts are hoping to achieve over the next five years? Set the stage for us, if you will. Sure. Well, I want to first begin by thanking our partners and colleagues who are with us today, and thank you for Better Health Partnership for giving us this opportunity to really share the story of Woodhill. Before we can really get into the, the story of Woodhill, we have to look back in history. And it really touches on what Dr. Bowen said around practices and policy that were rooted in, in, in racism. Woodhill is a place that was built in 1939. And unfortunately, much of the structure has not changed. But one thing that has remained the same is the people and the heart of the people who live there. They have legacy, they have culture, they have social connections that root them in this wonder, this place that could be wonderful, but a place that wasn't set up for them to really live in abundance. So the work that we are doing when we talk about transformation is really taking a comprehensive approach around education, health, social services, all those social determinants of health that we know impact the quality of life of people as they live and experience neighborhoods. So some of the practices that Dr. Bowen talked about are Woodhill Homes are an example of that redlining, black busing, um, being prohibited from being, having access to federal mortgages, which prevented black people from being able to lift themselves out of concentrated poverty into home ownership. So we see that that's the past of Woodhill, but the future is a collection of partners that are coming together and working with residents, sharing power with residents to really enhance the quality of life there. So you've heard about this awesome opportunity by HUD to activate the Woodhill Transformation Plan 
that really took over two years of a planning effort from community stakeholders, community residents, all coming together to really reimagine what this neighborhood could look like. So now we're at the place that we do have dollars to activate this plan, but moreover, we have a community who's committed to, it, to really um, giving more dollars, leveraging resources so that we can fully activate this plan and set this community up for a better future. I hope that answers your question, Donna. Uh, that was terrific, thank you. Um, just a, another quick follow-up question. Um, uh, looking, looking at the uh, beautiful painting in your background, I trust you're not here to sell us a bridge. Um, how are you going to make sure that the work that you're doing, the work that the, the that all the partners are doing, um, are going to ensure that the transformation becomes a mixed income community and doesn't result in displacement from gentrification? Because we've seen that a lot in our community. Sure. Well, first, our highest level of accountability are to our legacy residents. And our hope and our plans are such that we want to create better living conditions that support and retain our legacy residents, while also providing opportunities to really deconcentrate property by attracting new residents. It is not the intention to create conditions for gentrification. We are working with fantastic partners like Burden Bell Car Development Corporation, among others, who are doing things to make sure that we can maintain affordability, and also do things that are in the best interest of our residents. Secondly, the way that we set up our governance structure, we have more than 100 partners working together. And as I always share, we have to coordinate how we work together and how we work together better. And that's really around developing a collaborative governance structure that integrates residents at every level of power and decision-making so that if we see conditions starting to set up, we can have take immediate action by working with our residents to make sure that we are doing things in their best interest. So I think that's the best thing that we can do. And also working with our city, our city officials, our um, resident stakeholders, our other stakeholders to make sure that we are doing those things that won't set up conditions for displacement. Um, it is not the goal of this project to displace residents. It is our hope that they want to stay because we know that social connecti connectivity is a really big part of health and living in a really flourishing way of being in your neighborhood and in your home. Thank you. I, I hear in that the importance of the community voice in, in how you've structured your, your pretty vast partnership. And, and I think that's critical uh, to the success of the project. Um, thank you for that. We'll come back to you with some, some uh, questions and for some more conversation in a minute. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, turn to Jody Cunningham. Um, Jody is the leader of the Community Builders, and uh, I'm hoping that you can explain how the organization, the Community Builders, will, uh, what role they will have in the transformation, and how the Community Life Program in particular is going to help address many of the needs and disparities highlighted by the Woodhill Community Health Needs Assessment, which this is really founded on. Um, Ms. Cunningham? Thank you so much um, for that introduction and for Kim Lawn for giving us that um, overview as well. So I am the Director of Health and Housing for the Community Builders, and we are a fortunate partner on the Woodhill um, Choice Initiative. We are a mixed income housing developer. So mixed income is exactly what it means. We have residents that pay $0 in rent um, in, on a range up to market rate. And that's really the real experience of choice. And it can really create these mixed income neighborhoods that we know are so important to the growth of our cities. The community builders, we are a developer, like I said, but we also have our community life department, which is where I am housed. And we are the people lead on the Wood Hill initiative. So what that means is we are helping our partners drive together towards these outcomes that can for us around workforce development, education, civic engagement, community engagement, and health, which is of course my favorite because I have a public health background. Um, we are really well positioned to partner on this Woodhill Initiative because we were actually one of the first recipients of this Choice Neighborhoods program back in 2010 during the Obama administration with one of our Cincinnati um, housing sites in the Avondale neighborhood. So we've been through this um, and we are really excited to bring our learnings 
to this project as well. So I did want to zoom out a little bit, Donald, for us and just talk a little bit more about the Choice Neighborhood Program broadly. Mm -hmm. So this uh, program is really birthed out of the Hope Six kind of uh, reinvestment in public housing and switching that public housing to be mixed income housing, which we know makes for richer neighborhoods. So the Choice Program um, leverages significant public and private dollars to support locally driven strategies, which Kim Alon just walked us through a little bit. And these are addressing, um, you know, neighborhoods that need some more support that have traditionally been disinvested in in the past. So there may be distressed housing conditions um, that require a comprehensive approach towards transformation, which the residents and partners have spent a lot of intentional time figuring out. So there are a vast array of uh, stakeholders, local leaders, residents, public housing authorities, like we talked about, city, school, police, business owners, nonprofits, every sector um, that are all working together to really invest this $35 million in the most robust way with resident voice at the center. Wonderful. Um, and at the risk of uh, um, sounding uh, self-promoting, can you uh, talk a little bit about the, the partnership with Better Health Pathways Hub and how this might uh, uh, support the approaches that you're taking with the wraparound services, stabilization of housing, workforce development, all things we've heard about so importantly this morning? Absolutely. So our community life model um, and what HUD likes to see for this work is that we have case management services um, right after we get the award, right? We had to have these uh, case management services on site for the residents currently living in the, the Woodhill neighborhood within 60 days of our award. So it's really quick. So we have trained community life service coordinators that really walk with residents every step of the way, supporting them through relocation, connecting them to all of these great partners, right? They may, we may have all of these partners at the table, but if there's no connector there and there's no real access, then our residents can't take advantage of that. So our trained staff are going to work with residents to develop family success plans and support them with what they say they want help with, right? When we zoom in on the health piece of that, there are two key um, outcome areas that um, the Department of Housing really cares about, and it is insurance, making sure um, folks have health insurance and primary care connections. So making sure they have a medical home, a primary care doctor that they can go to, which I know you're going to hear a little bit more about that um, in a minute. But um, we are really excited about the initiative that we are going to engage in with Better Health Partnership because we are actually going to become a community organization in the hub model. So we will have our community life service coordinators in our phase one go through the training to begin to work in the hub model as um, extra leverage and resources and um, these robust connections for our residents. So we will participate in the hub model. I know we're getting ready to train um, this month in that. The next phase of that though, that we're also really excited about is that we have an initiative where we are going to bring residents into the fold. So we piloted resident leaders in the initiative I talked about in Cincinnati and hiring resident leaders through our housing organization to then work with um, mothers in our community, coach them to adopt healthy behaviors, connect them to resources, et cetera. The next step for us is to, to pay for them and support them to get training and then eventually find a career path as a community health worker or another entry level healthcare career, because we know that's a great pathway for a lot of single mothers, which is a lot of our residents that we're working together with. So we are excited to also bring resident leaders into the fold and eventually train them in the hub model so that they can begin to, number one, have a career pathway, and number two, support other residents in the community to make healthier choices. And, and I would say that as the uh, Community Pathways Hub model is reimbursed through Medicaid, this is an important piece of the sustainability that I think we're going to talk about more as we continue this conversation. Uh, it's really kind of the ideal business model. How do you get paid for work you're already doing? Um, this is one example. And this is, this is a way to pull the community in, not only to address their needs, but to start to develop their, their own economic independence. It's marvelous. 
Um, speaking of health, um, I will now introduce Dr. Claude Jones, um, and Dr. Jones is the, the president and CEO of Care Alliance, one of our critical federally qualified health centers in the Cleveland area. I've seen a map recently of the Wood Hill area and how it really sits in, in what you might almost call a health desert, just as we talk about food deserts. And, uh, and, and Jody just uh, highlighted the importance of, of establishing uh, insurance for the residents, uh, making sure that people have a, a, a patient-centered medical home for their primary care. Dr. Jones, um, I'd love to hear from you uh, how uh, Care Alliance plans to work their way into this neighborhood, uh, become part of the community and address these needs for the residents. Okay, so thanks for having me and uh, good morning, everyone. So, so right away, when you're looking at going into a, a new community, uh, you want to develop a sense of uh, trust uh, so that people understand uh, who you are, what you do. Uh, we're beginning to do that now. Uh, so, so our plan overall is to open a clinic on the third floor of the community center. Uh, I think this would be a, uh, a great area uh, for a uh, primary care center. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, a, um, a primary care medical home or a patient center medical home. So with a, uh, a patient or a community member, we want to build um, a team around that person to make sure they don't get lost to care, make sure there's good follow up. Uh, make sure we kind of work on those social determinants of health. This includes a, um, a, a care coordinator, nurse, medical provider, and also a, a behavioral health uh, specialist, which is also a big part of it. Health and wellness is so important uh, to a community. So the more we can, uh, you know, continue to educate, provide those services, work on those social determinants of, of, of health, get individuals um, uh, signed up for insurance. Uh, when we did the... Um, when we did the needs assessment, 34% uh, of the residents actually went to the emergency room to receive uh, primary care. Uh, so, so, you, so we wanna jump in right away and, and make sure uh, individuals know we're there uh, for the community. While, and what's also very interesting is, and you just mentioned it, uh, being in a uh, medically or designated a medically underserved area, when you're only 1.1 miles away from the Cleveland Clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, so this shows that um, the more we can do these type of programs, and maybe this is a national model when we're looking at redeveloping a community, bringing along the health and wellness part with it as well. That's terrific. And, and uh, maybe you can mention too, are there other ways that you see uh, uh, alliances and, and partnership with some of the larger health institutions in terms of offering services that the, the, the Care Alliance might not be able to provide? Sure, so right now we're working with the Cleveland Clinic, the uh, Towsic Cancer Center. Uh, they come over to our center uh, bi-monthly uh, with their mobile mammogram unit. But we're also adding optometry services to our scope of services this year as well. Uh, I think the more we continue to uh, work uh, with the larger uh, hospital systems, really understanding that um, many of these individuals don't have anywhere to go uh, once they leave our facility. So we have MOUs, active MOUs in place with uh, uh, the, the uh, three large hospital systems right now so that we can um, you know, get our patients over for care. Uh, there's good follow-up. We follow them through the system uh, because it can be overwhelming. You know, we look at health literacy uh, for our population as well. So just having that team around them where they can navigate through the system and, uh, you know, they get those services and make sure they follow up with us. So, you know, we're continuing to work on these things and, and make sure it's pretty seamless for the patient. We still have work to do, but we've come a long ways. That's terrific. Uh, you know, the, the themes are, are so clear of partnership and, you know, doing, doing what we're all good at. And uh, uh, this, is, this is marvelously promising for the future. Um, I know, the, too, that Care Alliance is going to be involved in this, this career development, um, um, uh, potentially using the Pathways Hub as a model, developing people into community health workers. Tell us more about your role there. Yeah, so, uh, and, and you mentioned it earlier, you know, the Pathway Hubs is something um, we already do and, and we should do. 
uh, to the best of our ability, but now we're able to get uh, paid for it, right? But it really, it, it really helps the community because it's linking them uh, to services. Many of these services happen on the hospital side. So again, it has to be uh, great communication, great processes in place so that patients don't get lost. And it's not, it's not necessarily about um, uh, revenue, but it's about the linkage uh, to services and making sure uh, they follow up over a period of time. Because even if you make a referral, if, if there's not a process in place where you actually follow up, follow up with the patient, follow up with the specialist, actually uh, have a conversation with the specialist, I'm an internist, I still see patients. Um, so I still experience some, you know, some of the pain points I've always had during my whole career. Uh, these things are getting better. But if, if we can share that health information mm -hmm. as well, you know, because many patients, they come back from the emergency room, all they have is a discharge summary, you know, and they don't have their medical records. So if I can get on the phone and have a conversation with a specialist and involve the patient at the same time, it knocks down all the barriers. And, and I have to say, you know, even within a large health system, as a primary care provider, this is this is a journey we all have to take together too. Um, you know, we have tremendous resources uh, in our electronic medical record. It's not the same as a conversation. Uh, I appreciate your your bringing that up. Uh, and last but not least, by any means, uh, I will introduce Ms. Marilyn Burns. Um, and Ms. Burns, uh, Ms. Marilyn, as I understand you like to be uh, addressed, can you please tell us about the needs you see in the Woodhill area for the resident healing and also your role in the survival peer network and how this will help to achieve these goals? You know, I've, I'm, I'm glad you called on me last. I really am, Donald, <laughs> because I've had an opportunity to hear everybody's piece of, of what they're bringing to the transformation that is about to happen in Woodhill. And let me say all of these things are very important to what is gonna happen here, but what's most important and the most important foundational piece that I have always been preaching since the day when I moved here is the healing of the spirit. Because if we don't, this is, our bodies are the home of our spirit. If we do not start building on that first and nothing else we do is gonna change. I say that because people here are broken. They've lived in historical, generational, intergenerational society traumas for so long that they don't see a way out of any of this. So what we're bringing new to the community is fabulous. But if you don't restore and revitalize a person's spirit, making them feel good about their self, then none of this is going to work. We are so reactive and proactive in what is happening here in our communities that at the 11th hour here now we're asking for help. This should have been generated, which was when we talk about structural racism and all of that, this was intended to be, to break us as a people. So now we've gotten to this point where, oh, six in one hand, half a dozen in another. I really don't care. Whatever they do, they do. But we need to dispel that type of mindset. I walk these grounds for 20 years. Every single day, you'll see me outside in somebody's face and somebody's talking to them every day. You're beautiful. Your walk looks great. You smile and you look this. And they look at me and who is this lady telling me these things? And I know that this is important to them because their, their, their mindset and their spirit has been broken for so long. Nobody has ever addressed that. Why don't they go to the doctor? I don't care. Who else cares about me? But we have to change that mindset of people. I don't care. I'm not going to eat right. I'm so sorry. I don't care. They have another agenda. And unless we address some of those agendas, you know, stop bringing surveys. Stop asking people, what do you see yourself in five years? Stop asking. They can't see their self past today. And if we want to start meeting people, really talk about caring, meeting people exactly where they are, no matter where it is, nothing's going to change. One single little word, one hello. I love you. How you doing, my king? How you doing, my prince? And, they, and, and, and it changes the trajectory of our spirits. We need to work on something first. Our foundation is built on the spirit of people. If you build it, they say, then they will come. If you build a better spirit in me, I'll not only feel better in my mind, 
I'll treat my body better. I'll do everything better because now I'm involved. I'll care about what's coming. You know, it's like the sunshine after a storm. Don't you feel better? You just go outside. You're just shaking something off of you. And we need to shake these some of these disparities. And we need to start with the spirit. I talk about it all the time. And I guess it's kind of hard for people to put a grasp around because they can't see it. But yes, you can. You can see it by the way people dress, by the way they walk, by the way they talk. You can't see the wind, but you know the factors of it when it blows a tree down or you see the leaves on the tree. You can see it. You can document it in another way that people collect data. You know, well, how are we going to monitor that? How are we going to keep track of that? Start talking to people. Then you'll see the body, the, the, the change in the community. Right now, every day that I walk out here, it's very almost zero to none to have people have a positive attitude about what's happening. You know, they didn't believe it. They still don't believe it until the first phases of this is being built. Okay, I've had, I've heard so much negativity around the activities that are going around, but I think, and we no longer, Donald, call it food deserts. We call it a food apartheid because it involves so much than just food, housing, literacy. It just and spirit, if you will. I preach spirit to the choir all the time, because if you don't feel good, if you don't start working on the spirit of people, treating them like they're human beings, involve them, no matter you look bum, but one day that shoe might be on your foot. So we have to have respect for each other. We have to bring love back into each other. We have to have a feeling that no matter where you are, you are still, you are still an important person. We have to remember that we are all descendants of a king. So that makes us royalty. And we need to remind each other of this, no matter what factor of life that you've come from. Always remember up today, down tomorrow, you know? So we need to remember that to respect each other as human beings. Yes, this has been like this red line. It's still being red line, only a different face. And so because we come here and talk to these people, uh, because we know their uh, educational and literature background is, is, all, is small. So I always say, meet people where they're at. You know, a lot of people here don't have PhDs. Heck, a lot of them haven't even finished school at any type of level. So they're intimidated when, when organizations come here and ask them these questions, they back away and then they build in a stronger wall to keep you out. Trust, oh my God, I preach this every day in every room. Trust is, a, I've been here 20 years. I'm still building trust in my community, but I've come a long way from where I am. So when I talk to people here and win their confidence, it's because I'm out here every day with them. I don't care what you look like. I don't care if you haven't had a bath today. I don't care about none of that. What I care about is how you feel inside about yourself. And if we start on those level of dealing with people they'll start feeling better about their self. They'll start being proactive in what's happening in their life. We got to start from the spirit first. You have a powerful message and you are a powerful speaker. And uh, you make me think that, you know, I drive through Woodhill to get to work. I need to find a way to stop and, and to say hello to the community myself. Uh, I think we have an obligation as, as a larger community to all learn what you just told us. You described a lot of trauma. Can you talk about the, uh, the survival peer network and how, how that fits into to the message that you're bringing and the work that you're doing? First of all, yeah, I see a lot of trauma and you know a lot, as, and, 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 and I'm very transparent because I'm brokenhearted about what I see. You know, you, you see trauma, domestic violence. And, and I often ask, and I have stopped and asked, and they could not answer me because it stunned the question just really, I don't know. What are you mad about? What, what are you mad about? We're all in this boat together. You're mad. You're trying to be, you, you're doing for what? Talk to me. What is it that's bothering? And a lot of times they don't know or they know, but it's so much built in that they, it's like peeling an onion. You take that first layer off, but even with that first layer, you, you, you're making progress, but it's so much that's encompassed and encumbered in just that one layer. I liked the conversation earlier today when you guys were talking about low hanging fruit. I use that all the time. 
What could be done in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, a year? We have to build on those things. So even that 30 days, it might not be much accomplished that you can visibly see, because let's face it, people are looking for data. What changed about this? But you can't really, sometimes you can't really measure it by graphs or by uh, you, you know data like numbers and uh, percentages. Sometimes you have to uh, 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 look at it like, I made somebody smile today. I made somebody go home and not talk to their kids in such a disrespectful way. And then if your kids is outside, I went home today because I told my baby I loved him. So we're dealing with so much trauma here. And it's trauma from, it's historical trauma. It's trauma every day. People don't see a way out. But we, the clinicians, the social workers, your next door neighbor, the man across the street in the grocery store, hell me, we have to make you feel good about yourself. I, how good does it feel for somebody to give you a hug or even say hello or tell you that I love you, you're important, you look good today. It changes, it changes everything about what our next step is going to be that day. That's beautiful. And, and Ms. Marilyn, I don't know if you can see the chat while you're uh, while you've been talking to us, but you just received a standing ovation. Um, oh, wow. If we were all in the room together, we'd all be on our feet. Uh, oh, thank God. you for the, the power of your message and, and for the truth that you're speaking. Um, I would just open to our other panelists, Kimelon, Jody, Claude, please uh, tell us more about what you're doing and how that how that um, intersects with the the needs that uh, that Ms. Marilyn has just just uh, outlined so well. Sure, I'll, I'll just jump in and just start talking about purpose-built communities. Purpose-built communities is a very similar model to choice. It's a comprehensive approach to neighborhood revitalization, really rooted in equity, but moreover rooted in working with our residents and listening to them. Ms. Marilyn sits on our executive board. We do a lot of listening and not just listening, but doing. So with purpose-built communities, there's three strategic pillars around education, the creation of a high quality educational pipeline in the neighborhood, mixed income housing with the goal of deconcentrating poverty, and then lastly, wellness, which is really broadly defined by community. It can include an entire gamut of everything from direct access to healthcare, healthy foods, employment, transportation, but really working in a concerted way in a defined neighborhood to implement the strategy. The work is led by a community quarterback who really leads the initiative, secures resources and partnerships. And we are working with Burton Belcar, the development corporation for this neighborhood to position them for that role among their other work that they're doing. And that's really important. As we talk about leveraging resources and coordinating, we need a central organization that can help us to coordinate and determine how we work together and how we can be responsive to those needs that emerge from community in real time. So looking farther down the road, it's fantastic that we have this five-year grant from HUD but we know to truly um, achieve transformation and, and maintain it and also not stay stagnant, we need to have a plan for sustainability. So working with Burdenville Car and all of our community partners, we are positioning purpose-built communities as the vehicle for sustainability beyond this five-year grant term. We know that transformation is probably gonna take a little bit longer than that. And we wanna make sure that we're nurturing growth as we encourage other partnerships that will continue to propel this neighborhood. And moreover, we wanna make sure that our residents are happy. To Ms. Marilyn's point, we want, to, we want to support healing. We want to help to heal this community from those past wounds that we talked about, historical practices and racism at every level of government, from local policy to federal policy. And it takes a lot of work to undo a lot of the damage. And as I share with people, I think it's really important that we listen to a community that's heard no more than yes, and really work to establish trust as we do everything that we promise to do. It took a lot of work to get this transformation plan together. And a big part of that work was really allowing neighborhood neighbors to feel comfortable to hope. To Ms. Marilyn's point, there was a lack of hope because they've heard no so many times, so many broken promises. And I think now is our opportunity as a community and as leaders in this community to really deliver on our promises. Thank you so much, Kimelon. Dr. Jones, um, you know, we talked, uh, we, we heard Ms. Marilyn talk about, um, you know, the trauma that, that the community has gone through. Um, how can uh, a healthcare provider coming into the community help to address that? All right. So again, it comes down to building that trust, you know, over a period of time. So 
uh, the uh, community has developed uh, community ambassadors. Okay, so how can we work with those ambassadors to kind of uh, canvas the community? And first of all, find out what the needs are, you know, kind of, uh, you, you know, what are the expectations of, of, of the community? What are they looking for? How can we help assist with that? And it's not just that, it's getting the community involved, empowering the community uh, to be a part of their healthcare. Uh, so, so that could mean uh, on a volunteer basis. That could means uh, uh, that could mean um, uh, hiring uh, job opportunities uh, for the community as well. Uh, so this all takes time, you know, to to really build and formulate. But uh, I think because of the trauma, we need to have resources in place also that address that. So that's why the behavioral health uh, portion will really be, uh, I believe, will really be effective. Uh, this is an absolute um, game changer. Uh, this is something that is, in, in my estimation, is uh, monumental. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to utilize this model uh, nationwide. So uh, again, it's about building that trust, uh, working, with the, working with the community, getting them involved in everything you do. And I think this trust just builds over a period of time. Thank you so much. Um, Jody, uh, the Community Builders is, is uh, an organization that works in many different communities, uh, not just in, in our neighborhood. How, how does your group understand how to meet this neighborhood, this community, where they are? Such a great question. And we would be so unsuccessful if we did not rely and work together with existing residents and community partners like purpose-built communities, for example. Um, we are spread, you know, across several regions um, and that's really great. And we can take lessons learned and challenges and know what works and try to implement some things that work in neighborhoods. But we really rely heavily on building relationships locally. And, you know, I think it's really important for us too. We are not a developer that comes in, builds some housing and leaves. But when we go into a neighborhood, we are there for the long haul. So the sustainability work that Kim Alon talks about, we'll still be there uh, working together with them well past the choice initiative. We are coming in to stay and our investment shows that. So I love that you talked to Donald about the sustainability uh, model through the Pathways Hub, because a part of that for us in our community life department is we are grant funded in the work that we do. So we do rely heavily on grants and, um, you know, working towards those outcomes that we talk about. But I love the idea of the hub model because it does give us some sustainability built into those services that we provide, because we know just because we're coming in in this choice grant for a short period of time, the issues don't go away the, the, you know, right when the money goes away or runs out. So we work really uh, closely together with those local entities to develop plans that we know will work and are sustainable. Wonderful. Um, I will uh, make sure that I've asked for folks uh, to uh, ask questions through the chat. Um, we have such a wonderful panel of speakers. Um, be happy to, to uh, convey any questions that people have. Um, there were a couple of comments from I, I saw from uh, Dr. Winslow about some work that's being done uh, by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to create a culture of health in our communities. Um, and, and he also uh, shared a great quote, all change moves at the speed of trust. And I think that, uh, that really echoes what a lot of uh, our panelists have been saying. Um, I would love to hear from any of you, uh, just, just an example, what does success look like? I, I respect uh, Ms. Marilyn's comment that, you know, we're not we can't ask the question, what are we doing in five years? Because we, we haven't answered the question, what are we doing today and tomorrow? But, but for all of us in our roles in, in the efforts in this community, tell me something that will let you know that you are on the path, that, that, that there is success there. Well, I'll just start with purpose-built communities <clears throat> being so similar to the choice model, really the value that this model brings is around the focus on education. So if you look at the Woodhill Homes Needs Assessment, we learned that only 8% of the children who are entering kindergarten are kindergarten ready. For us, that means partnering with our high quality early learning providers in the neighborhood 
to really enhance accessibility to high quality early learning. There will be a new early learning center built on campus, also working with parents around understanding the necessity of high quality early learning, and then also really enhancing their opportunities for other, er other early learning opportunities in the neighborhood. So for me, one big area of success would be increasing those in kindergarten readiness rates. And we know that it's also an indicator of later academic success and later life. The other piece for me is working with CMSD, who is our educational partner. I'm really proud that they have they are looking at how do we best take advantage of all the innovative practices they've done and build on that with our with a foundation to really enhance education. We also learned from the needs assessment that our kids in this neighborhood go to more than 60 schools throughout the city. And we're talking about people who face transportation challenges, employment challenges. So for me, I'm also about, I always share that when you're poor, it's, it's difficult and it's expensive. So we can make high quality choice accessible in the neighborhood to make life easier and better for the people who live, work and play there. To me, that's the biggest area of success. And then lastly, my other measure of success is just doing what we say we would do. I want to say that we activate that Wood Hill Transformation Plan and add it on to it. I don't want to be the uh, continuer, that's a, such a word, of broken promises. So for me, I'm looking at the education component and making sure that we do everything else, plus then some, that, that are including the Wood Hill Transformation Plan. And that gets right to the heart of the trust issue, which we've all been talking about. Others on the panel, measures of success. All right, so I think right away. And, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jody. I'll be very brief. Um, I we we have a lot of outcomes that we are held to hit when it comes to this plan, right? You can imagine with $35 million being invested in a neighborhood, we have to do a lot of work in all of these areas. But when I think about 10 years from now and looking back at the work we did, I think the number one indicator of success for me is. Did we leverage our skills, our organizational capacity, our privilege, and whatever that looks like to really just uplift the resident's voice and build capacity for them so that they can carry forward the vision that they created without us? That would be the gold standard, I think, for me, is that we uplift Miss Marilyn's voice and the rest of her neighbors to really do what they want to do and give them all, you know, help them partner together to bring a powerful voice to make that a reality. Terrific. Dr. Jones. Yes, thank you for that. So um, I want to go back a little bit uh, to what Kimelon said. And uh, is it, so K through 12 uh, education, that's just so important, uh, making sure uh, we, you know, we have good education on that level, but it's also the health education as well, making sure uh, we stay in front of the community, we're educating them on uh, disease states. We know uh, during the health, uh, during the needs assessment, that uh, chronic disease is rampant, especially uh, in that area. Uh, so how can we help stamp that out? Um, COVID education as well. Uh, we're working with uh, RTA. They've actually converted uh, one of their buses into a, uh, a vaccination unit and we're over at Woodhill um, about every two weeks uh, with that bus, uh, just making sure uh, we get that information and also uh, important vaccination information over to the community. Uh, jobs, workforce, uh, creating internships uh, if possible, um, hopefully bringing in members of the community uh, to be a part of that and also health outcomes just overall now we may have to look retrospectively at some point, maybe five, 10 years down the road to see if we really made a difference. Uh, again, focusing on those chronic disease states, um, uh, not just uh, diabetes, hypertension, uh, HIV, uh, things like that. And also the real big one that we tend to forget about is the opiate uh, epidemic as well that's really been ravaging uh, our communities. So uh, I think those overall uh, who's utilizing the services, how much uh, over a period of time, and are we really taking a look at those social determinants of health, uh, transportation, uh, food, uh, things like that. Uh, a part of this will be a food pantry, I'm working real closely with the food banks. So uh, there's a myriad of uh, outcomes we can take a look at, but those are some of the ones. Thank you for, for all of those uh, ideas. Um, Ms. Marilyn, please, I want to hear from you. Yes, go, go ahead. Uh, I think uh, food of the spirit, 
My God, how what a perfect note to end on. And we often ask sometimes, what is the food of the spirit? Respect, love, kindness. Uh, you know, all these things help to change the trajectory of what we do and how we treat each other on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I, 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 I often tell people I'm not a religious fanatic, but I am very much spiritual. And I often think about the beginning of the book. What is God? He is love. He is spirit. It's nothing that you see, but it is definitely something that you can feel. And when we start with these things, mm, our light, our light, we have to bring back to the community. I would like to, I would like to just drive down the street one day and see this bright light around this whole community. And people say, what is that? That's Woodhill. That's Woodhill's light shining, shining because of all the things that have been said here today to move the needle forward in a more positive direction. What better way to let a light shine throughout a community? Shine with sincerity, shine with hope shine with love, shine with empowerment, encouragement. It's such a powerful thing. All these things that we can bring to the table and that piece of efficacy that I have not heard that word in the conversation today, mm -hmm. but what is that power, that support that's gonna move all these things to a place where we can look at equity and say, yes, we've all been served with the fruit of the spirit of all the things that have been brought to the table today. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, there's a question from the chat um, from uh, Angela uh, Campitelli. Does this effort to include, uh, excuse me, does this effort include helping residents create their own small business, not just jobs working for others? That's so important because, you know, there are efforts across the city to improve the utilization of minority owned businesses. Um, Cleveland Clinic Health uh, community health outreach is focusing on heal, hire, and invest. Um, contract with, buy from minority-owned businesses. Um, uh, tell to any of you, Kim Alon, because I know you answered this in the chat before, or anybody else who has any input, tell us how how do we start the spirit of entrepreneurship? Actually, I can't say we start it. We nurture it. It's already yeah. there. Yeah. There are people who aspire to work for themselves. And I think that's a part of wealth building and really a, power, a part of power sharing. So we do have partnerships in place with a number of our workforce providers and also small business development organizations that are going to help nurture and help support residents who want to move down that path towards entrepreneurship. And I think it's a great thing, especially because we know that there might be some residents who don't, who don't necessarily fit in a box of traditional employment, nor do they want to. And I think that's fine. So um, definitely um, want to include that as a focus in our workforce development strategy is already in there. Being part of the community and being out here every day, I just had this conversation with the gentleman yesterday. Uh, there are people that, let's face it, just do not want to go to college, but they want to know a trade. I know a lot of young men. I have, I'm working with two gentlemen right now about showing young people starting at uh, school age, say from the uh, ninth grade all the way through and getting an apprenticeship after the training to some college credits or whatever that want to be become builders or construction workers, even some young women. Oh, I want to do that. Oh, I want to go to college, but I want to know a trade. And like I'm working with these gentlemen trying to get this on, uh, trying to connect them with the right people to talk to as well. So we can get this off the board. Isn't it? And even women, you know, I, uh, so several years ago, I had a contracting company and people were saying, and I, it was me and this uh, uh, other older gentleman that started it. And I often heard people say, what are these two old people going to do? But we build, I build porch decks, basements. I've been up on roofs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's wonderful for women to say, you know, punch their boyfriend or punch their husband in a conversation, say, look at that woman. If she could do it, why can't I? So women, we, we want to introduce this to women as well. Young people who don't think about going to college. These things are important because, you know, it gives them a sense of pride. I know that it did for me being able to build something out of nothing. And, and, and that's what we want to do. Uh, just hands-on work such as that and, and building up the spirit. I have to keep going back to that. And in order for these things to be coming to fruition and become possible, we have to change the way we feel inside and the way we treat each other. 
to encourage and empower each other to say, hey, if we can do this, we can do this. I love you. You love me. Let's come together. Let's work on this collaboratively. Let's bring people of like minded that are trying to do this together. And oh my God, what an awesome thing it is to start with one match, light another one, and then another one. Can you imagine what kind of light that would bring into our communities? Terrific. Um, another question from the chat was about kind of the structure of, of the whole project. Um, asking which the what uh, organization is the lead? Kimelon, you were you were describing in your answer a little bit. Can you can you talk about the larger project, sort of the structure and who the partners are and so forth? Sure, and I'm also going to invite my colleagues in case I miss something because there's so many piece, moving pieces and parts. The city of Cleveland, the Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority, received the $35 million Hood Choice Neighborhood Implementation Grant. And I also think it's important to note that there was a two-year planning process that preceded the actual implementation grant. And the two-year planning process came with the grant and allowed us to do really robust community engagement to understand what the community wanted to see, to understand the needs in the community, and really evolved into this Wood Hill Transformation Plan. So we have the community builders who are leading the people part of this holistic strategy. And the people part deals with social and support services, like Jody talked about the case management, community life. Um, it also deals with education, health, employment, um, entrepreneurship, transportation. I equate it to those social determinants of health factors that we know impact the quality of life. Then we have a housing component and the community builders, I do believe, Yes, Jody's nodding, are also leading that part of the strategy as well. The housing component is this built environment, the green space is the actual construction of the new, the soon to be redeveloped Woodhill homes, which will be a combined uh, um, mixture of multifamily, well, multifamily apartments, townhomes um, that will replace the 487 units, but also lead to actually 800 planned units. So we have more units that we're going to have than we start with, started with. And then the last part of the strategy is around neighborhood and neighborhood is everything in between from, um, and I'm gonna have, ask Joey to help me because I always get confused between housing and neighborhood, but neighborhood is being led by city architecture, Jody. Yes, I think that's safe to say. <laughs> okay. And we're also talking about the other amenities, green spaces, public spaces, looking at the topography of how the neighborhood is situated to really be conducive right now. As I understand, it's built on a slant. Oh, CMHA, thank you, Monique. My colleague, Monique Williams from the engagement group just texted me and said that um, the city of Cleveland is leading the neighborhood strategy. So once again, as you can see, we lean on each other and depend on each other as we move this train forward. But um, that's really the structure. We have these organizations that are leading those particular strategies, but we have a slew of partners that are working to activate those strategies. And through all of that, we have our residents who we are listening to and helping us to guide our, guide our efforts and set the priorities for this work, in addition to complying with hood. I have to put that in as well. Wonderful. I would just... Yeah, go ahead, Joey. Quickly add, yeah, I'll click, quickly add to what Kimlan said. Um, I want to uplift exactly what you said about the housing. The fact that we are bringing 800 new mixed income units to the neighborhood, which is the most, I, I believe, of any other choice grant from 2010 to now, which is a really huge investment. And I know when I talk to some of our other health partners, you know, whether in a hub model or something similar in other cities, the number one issue that they find when they're trying to support residents is to actually find safe, healthy, affordable housing. And I think the real opportunity we have here in this project is to leverage that all of these residents ideally will have safe, healthy, affordable housing. And we can really use that as a platform to really go further with a lot of these other areas where housing is sometimes a real barrier. Because if you don't have safe, healthy, affordable housing, we can't really talk about getting your child into preschool, right? A lot of what Ms. Marilyn said, we have to start with the basics. We have to meet people where they are. And housing is so critical. I know all of you on this call understand that. So we have a really really um, exemplary opportunity with that piece. Um, 
the other thing I wanted to highlight when we talk about jobs and workforce development is that um, with HUD, we have real um, goals where it comes to uh, hiring from the neighborhood, when it comes to the construction of these new units, demolition and building new. We have real goals around um, hiring women, hiring minority businesses, um, and that's a real central piece of this work too. So not only supporting people through entrepreneur paths and workforce programs, but hiring within the community for the work that we are doing in the community. So I was just going to ask if there's a website that people can go to uh, to find out more about this project, see if they can contribute. Um, as I think of that question, I also think there is also a, a large segment of the community that doesn't have digital access. And uh, um, I know that that's a part of the plan as well. Um, can, where can we go to find out more and how is, how is the digital divide going to be addressed? Well, there's a really robust partnership with Digital C who are installing towers. Uh, in the meanwhile, installing towers in the CMHA campus to provide access in the short term. But long term, there is a, definitely a plan to make sure that everyone in Woodhill Homes will have access to digital connectivity that's being wired in. We're talking about innovative state-of-art housing that will have those amenities that some of us take for granted. I saw a really great question in the chat that comes that talks about the structure. And I meant to talk about this in terms of how we are working together. We have a governance structure being led by a steering committee. Steering committee is made up of residents, it's made of community stakeholders, and those leads that we talked about, the community builders, purposeful communities, and CMHA all working together to ensure that we are um, complying with HUD guidelines, but also listening to and being true to this Woodhill transformation plan. We also have um, transformation team working at the neighborhood level, coordinating all the partners. And that's once again, also comprised with residents and community stakeholders and project partners who are working together to implement this plan. And then lastly, we have this body of individuals who will be helping to connect with other influencers and other resources to really make up this Wood Hill, um, Wood Hill Transformation Coalition is what we're calling it. So for more information, there will be information on the CMHA website. There's some there already. There is some, um, we'll share some links at the end of this presentation to really be able to learn more. And I do believe the community builders will be also having information in one consolidated place to really share about the project, the pro progress of the project as we move forward. Beautiful. Um, and Jody just did uh, enter a, a link into the chat. So uh, please, please refer there and we'll, we'll share any information that we have. We're up against time with uh, just about a minute left. I'm gonna say, Ms. Marilyn, would you please close us out? My goodness, this, this has just been so overwhelming to me today. It's, I, I often tell people I, I've, I've seen a little bit of the accolades and I thank you very much for me, but I must say that, that these words were put upon my heart by someone who's much higher than all of us. I often talk to my father. He's been talking to me all through this conversation, giving me the right words to say, giving me the right spirit to touch his people. And we are his people. And I'm just a vessel. I'm not very important. I'm just a vessel, but I'm humbled to be used by somebody who cared that much about me and to put me in a position here to speak to you all, all today from the heart, from the spirit. And it, it, it's just so humbling to me to be able to touch the hearts and minds of people who are in power, who can make take the words that I have expressed to you guys today and make them work, give you some food for thought, give you food for the spirit. And I just hope that everything that we have talked about today and, and will truly sink in and truly motivate you to reach out to your brother or sister no matter what position in life they are in. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you to all of our panelists and, and to the, uh, uh, those in the audience who are contributing great, uh, great questions and, and great comments. Uh, it's now time for a break. I, I certainly need one. Um, we'll be back at uh, 1020 and we'll start right back up again and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you all. We are back. Um, I am breathless after that. Um, uh, what a marvelous uh, discussion that, that we have and what a marvelous uh, energy that, that we can bring to such a, an important part of our community. Um, part of the uh, 
um, obligation of Better Health Partnership as an organization is to make an annual report uh, of our activities. We've always included that as part of our learning collaboratives and today is no different. So to report on uh, the, uh, the activities of a Better Health Partnership over the past year, I bring you my, my dear friends and colleagues, uh, Rita Horowitz, the president and CEO of Better Health Partnership, joined by Chris Mundorf, who's the director of data analytics and reporting for Better Health Partnership. Rita and Chris. Thank you, Donald. Um, it's wonderful to see everybody. Thank you for joining us today and for coming back, hopefully after the break. I never, never quite know about that. Um, I must say though, after hearing the speakers before me um, and Miss Marilyn, you're gonna be a very, very hard act to follow. <laughs> so I will do my best uh, to keep everybody's uh, attention like she had. I hope you're all feeling um, as inspired as I am from the presentations this morning. And uh, Ms. Marilyn, I think that if we had done this collaborative in person, you may have seen an awful lot of tears in that audience today. And I think you would have been overwhelmed with hugs from everybody afterwards from your powerful words. So thank you for sharing those with us. Before we get started, let me mention that uh, we are planning, and the key word here is planning, to see everyone in 2022 in person again. As of right now, Better Health Partnership and our sister collaboratives in Columbus and Cincinnati are planning a statewide learning collaborative in June that'll be held in Columbus uh, for everybody to come together from across the state. And Better Health also plans to hold its local learning collaborative in November in 2022 uh, at Corporate College again. Carol and I figured that since they've been holding our deposit since 2019 on that venue, we really ought to cash in on it. So <laughs> here's hoping we can all learn how to coexist with this pandemic uh, and move forward with that. As uh, Donald mentioned, Chris and I are excited to feature some additional highlights of our programmatic work of our members working together to make a difference in the health and the well being for so many, many, many individuals living in Northeast Ohio. I'm going to share updates on uh, infants and children's health, and Chris will center more on our adult health work, and he'll share some early social determinant of health data emerging out of our Pathways Community Hub, which you heard a little bit about in the uh, Woodhill um, transformation presentation. Next slide, please. So I wanted to open up my presentation today with this slide, which I believe visually captures the very spirit of and the value that collaboration brings to our community. Organizations who have the courage to take chances and risks to make significant change. Our members work together to make a difference and reach across the aisle, if you will, with their peers to collaborate, innovate, and find lasting solutions for positive change in our community and with the thousands of individuals living in Northeast Ohio. To quote Ms. Marilyn earlier, our foundation is built on the spirit of people, members and trust. As you also heard or saw in the chat, at least from Dr. Ted Winslow earlier, change happens at the speed of trust and trust happens at the speed of relationships. And no one, no one knows this experience better than Better Health Partnerships members and just how critical trust is to helping us be successful and accomplish our mission. Through the years to help facilitate that trust, Better Health has provided that safe space for our competing health systems and others to share their secret sauce for success and their best practices that have resulted in many significant improvements in healthcare delivery in the community that we've all enjoyed. And speaking of change, the global pandemic has brought on new challenges and accelerated the need to innovate and has shown that the most successful organizations were able to pivot and profoundly change the way they deliver healthcare to the communities they serve. And collaboratives like Better Health Partnership also needed to pivot and innovate to ensure that our priorities stayed in lockstep with this changing landscape. But innovation and change doesn't happen without strong and influential individuals leading the way to motivate others to change, to create experiences of exceptional value and lasting impact. Next slide, please. 
One such influential leader is Dr. Donald Ford. As you heard him mention, he's been promoted to the chair of family medicine for Cleveland Clinic. And we just wanna take a moment here to acknowledge Dr. Ford's leadership and his influence in our collaborative efforts over the years. And I know many of you uh, join me in this heartfelt acknowledgement. Donald has worked with Better Health since 2013, leading our clinical advisory committee, moderating our convening events and learning collaboratives, which you can all see how he does it so, so very eloquently, and serving as our chief medical officer for the past four years when I assumed the role of CEO. His expertise, his knowledge of the healthcare system, his passion for community health and health equity have contributed strongly to our successful expansion and our pivot in providing new services that now operate at that intersection of healthcare delivery and social determinants of health. We wouldn't be where we are today in this newly expanded space without him. He's been instrumental in helping us establish the Pathways Community Hub in 2020 and its value proposition for health systems and community organizations to work together to better coordinate care for individuals and patients with challenging social health and economic needs in Cuyahoga County. So although Donald will no longer be able to continue in his chief medical officer role for us, we will continue to work with him and his primary care teams at Cleveland Clinic to help achieve our mission and goals for improving equitable population health in our community. And something tells me that with his love of theater and acting, which he didn't mention earlier, we just might see him on the stage again sometime. Next slide, please. So Donald, thank you for your leadership and all you've done for us in our community. We wish you all the best in your new role going forward. Next slide, please. So I will start with the updates on our babies and share how we're working together to make a difference to support maternal and infant health across our region. In 2018, clinical experts from our birthing hospitals in Cuyahoga County formed action team number four, led by Better Health Partnership, which was one of 11 action teams under that umbrella of first year Cleveland, working on infant mortality, came together to share data, to hold learning circles and commit to quality improvement efforts to reduce extreme preterm birth, the leading cause of infant mortality in Cuyahoga County. Our improvement work centered on helping moms get better access to prenatal care and timelier interventions for high-risk pregnancies. In 2020, this graph shows the lowest preterm birth rate of 11.4 was recorded since 2015 when it was 14.9 in Cuyahoga County. We'll all be curious to see if this trend continues but I also want to point out that it's not all good news. Um, there still exists a very large disparity between the county preterm birth rate of 11.4 and the African-American preterm birth rate of 15.5. So as I know I share with many of you on this Zoom uh, webinar today, we believe that social, mental, behavioral health and economic factors are definitely contributing to this disparity. So Better Health Partnership is embarking on an initiative with our Pathways Community Hub called Nourishing Beginnings with First Year Cleveland, the Greater Cleveland Food Bank and Case Western Reserve University to help pregnant individuals experiencing food insecurity obtain access to healthy food to promote a healthier pregnancy and achieve better birth outcomes. This project is just getting underway, but we absolutely will share our progress with you as we go along. Next slide, please. So next on the continuum is children and the work we're doing together to make a difference related to the factors contributing to children's poor health outcomes. We know there's a strong relationship between children's health and academic student success. And our collaborative partners wanna do all they can to help children reach their full and academic potential. The childhood conditions that we're focusing on include asthma, obesity, lead exposure, and mental health. For those of you who don't know, asthma left uncontrolled and aggravated by environmental triggers such as air pollution is the number one medical cause for school absenteeism. You're gonna hear a little bit more about asthma and its relationship to air quality and climate change later from our climate change group. 
Exacerbated by the pandemic, childhood obesity rates in Ohio and across the United States are at epidemic levels. Obesity left unattended will result in experiencing chronic disease such as diabetes and hypertension as adults. And I think Dr. Sherry Boland did a great job earlier this morning of drawing those connections and being concerned about the cardiovascular health of adults in our community. With regard to lead testing, why are we focusing on lead testing improvement? Well, studies in Cleveland children have found that children with elevated blood lead levels are 27% less likely to be on track for kindergarten, are 25 to 30% more likely to enter the juvenile justice system, and 34% more likely to be incarcerated as adults. No matter how small, there are no safe levels of lead and lead poisoning is 100% preventable, and we are out to eradicate it. And finally, and maybe most sobering right now, is how the pandemic has exacerbated mental behavioral health issues in children. Suicide is now the leading cause of death of children 10 to 14 years of age in the state of Ohio. That was stunning to me. So we need to work together with these issues and to help improve the health of our children. Next slide, please. So these are the organizations that are currently reporting their data to Better Health Partnership on children's health and working together to address these issues. They make up the Better Health Partnership Children's Leadership Team. And this is uh, co-chaired by Dr. Stephen Spaulding from Akron Children's Hospital and Dr. Drew Hertz from University Hospitals Rainbow Babies and Children's and Tech Neon Company. We also have subcommittees that work with our children's leadership team that consist of providers, social services, community organizations, school systems, academia, who work on these strategic priorities that I've just mentioned. Next slide, please. So understanding that each of these conditions I've talked about uh, are contributing to poor health outcomes, we are striving to improve care and should, we should be working and focusing on well child care to improve outcomes. So in 2021, the Children's Health Leadership Team began designing strategies for a comprehensive approach to youth wellness. These include prevention, screening, and intervention for physical, mental, behavioral health, and social needs. And it involves working synergistically across all sectors, healthcare providers, school professionals and community-based organizations, all, all sectors that work and touch children's lives. We really believe there is no wrong door to helping children achieve optimal health and wellness. We wanna ensure that no matter what door that child knocks on for help, we will ensure a coordinated strategy to assist them in addressing their needs. Next slide, please. So if we wanna focus on improving youth wellness, we begin by assessing the baseline of whether or not children seen by our primary care providers who submit data to us are obtaining well child care. That's where we have to start. In looking at the 2020 data we obtained from our clinical partners, we highlight a significant disparity in the well child primary care visits by race and ethnicity with black and Latinx showing a 14% drop and white non-Hispanic showing a slight increase of 6% from 2019 data. We know that COVID has had a disproportionate impact on communities of color and lower income. And this graph is reflective of this impact on children and their well care. Next slide, please. So within those visits seen on the previous slide by race and ethnicity, here we highlight the impact of COVID on communities with lower socioeconomic status. This graph shows the neighborhood relationship between area deprivation index and well child care rates, reflecting the higher number of children missing their well child care in 2020 that come from lower income neighborhoods. Next slide, please. So when we look deeper, we can see, for example, from this slide, the relationship between a child coming in for a sick or a well visit to their doctor and whether or not they received a lead test order, and whether or not they obtained a lead test if it was ordered. 
Children without a 2020 well child care visit were 67% more likely to be missing a lead order and 46% more likely to also be missing a lead test. Now imagine, this is just lead, imagine if the same missed opportunities are happening for children struggling with obesity, asthma, and mental health needs. For example, maybe they never even have the opportunity to ask the question or answer the question, are they struggling with anxiety or depression or have suicidal thoughts? So we need to do a better job of getting children in for their well child care. And this just speaks to the kids that we know are coming in. We still have to find the children who aren't even coming in. So this is why we need to go very big in our approach for this mission. Next slide, please. So the secret sauce and the real value of Better House Collaborative lies with its members and their commitment to improving in the areas we identify as high need. They don't stop innovating until the problems are solved. They come together to share data, information, and learn from one another what is working well. They find the bright spots, and then they share that secret sauce with others so everyone can get better. In September of 2021, we had our annual report to the community webinar, and Dr. Matt Tian from the Metro Health System presented their secret sauce as an emerging best practice for improving lead testing rates in children. You can see from this graph that Metro Health created a system-wide quality goal to improve lead testing. They made it a priority, and they took testing from 48% to 86% just by drawing blood in the office and not sending those patients and children to the lab. It was an amazing, simple intervention. I call it simple. For them, it was not. There were a lot of workflow changes that needed to happen, and as you can imagine with any change, overcoming the resistance to how we normally do business was also necessary. Another example of an influential leader in our community for sustainable change that's making a difference. Next, they will take their mobile vans into the community to find children who are not coming into the doctor for lab tests and they will find a way to get them tested. For more information on all of this, please visit our website um, that whole presentation was recorded and you can find out more about just how to accomplish this work and perhaps replicate it in your own organizations. Next slide, please. Another great example of our members working together to find solutions uh, is in the area of mental and behavioral health. This slide represents the multi-sector collaboration we are facilitating between Cleveland and Akron schools, primary care, behavioral health providers, academia, community resources, and the Ohio Suicide Prevention Task Force to address the rapidly rising rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide in our children. This subcommittee, led by Dr. Mary Gabriel of University Hospitals Rainbow Babies and Children, has been meeting monthly in 2021 to address the goals for ensuring that all children are screened for mental and behavioral health needs, to improve communications, data sharing between all of these sectors to enhance uh, timely interventions and better care coordination for our children and to build competencies in the school workforce with community members, with parents and primary care providers for, for identifying risk in children earlier and intervening sooner. Next slide, please. The Mental Health Subcommittee identified the need to establish more effective referrals between primary care and behavioral health providers in the community and with seed funding <clears throat> from United Healthcare, we started a pilot project in March of 2021 to build a more efficient and effective referral system between Rainbow Babies and Children and the center's behavioral health care providers. Next slide, please. And early data shows a positive impact with two of the most important elements we're trying to improve here. One is the percentage of people and families that we connect with. And secondly, to be able to get information back to the referring primary care provider about what happened, whether that patient was connected and what interventions are being done. So in this pilot, we show that 67% of the families referred from rainbow babies and, uh, and children's to the centers were successfully connected with. And 100% of those had a successful feedback loop to the referring primary care provider. This all helps to enhance communication 
and to facilitate more timely care coordination between those providers. The connection rate is impressive, trending higher than other projects Better Health has worked on, connecting patients to community organizations and resources which only show 50% connection rate. Next slide, please. So in looking ahead, here's the roadmap for where we're going in the next few years with this multi-stakeholder comprehensive approach to youth wellness. And an overview of the implementation strategies we will use to achieve the goals for improving children's health as well as academic student success. Those strategies include awareness building and training. We need to increase awareness of the importance of well child care with parents, with educators, pre-K organizations and all gatekeepers of children. Remember, no wrong door. We want to implement universal screenings for physical, mental health and social needs to identify needs early in children. These can happen in primary care, behavioral health, even schools, even school settings. And we're talking about that right now. We need to build better data sharing infrastructure. This is huge. If we want to improve information sharing between primary care, behavioral health, schools, and the community so that we can, in fact, improve well child care and outcomes. We want to enhance care coordination. That data will help us to do that, to ensure children who are referred to care and resources for interventions obtain that care in a timely and appropriate manner, and that that feedback loop goes back to the referring source. We need to measure, monitor, and evaluate results. This informs our continuous improvement. It highlights our best practices for further dissemination, and it builds the case for future investments in effective interventions proven to work. Finally, we will replicate and scale what works. So thank you for your time. I'm going to now hand over to uh, Chris Mundorf. Thanks, Rita. So yeah, I, I appreciate Rita kind of framing it up with our work with babies and kids. I'll be talking a bit more about our work with adults that then kind of segged into our work with within COVID-19. Um, similar to what Rita sh showed with kids in Northeast Ohio, uh, there was a similar drop in primary care visits for adults during this past year and a half of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, compared to the number of visits we saw among our member uh, systems in 2019, we saw around a 5% decrease in people with a visit which translates to around 12,000 fewer to older adults, adults with chronic disease coming for a healthcare visit. Next slide. Obviously most of the adults we track through our member uh, organizations uh, have at least one risk factor that uh, we know as a risk factor of um, higher morbidity and mortality of COVID-19, uh, things like diabetes, high BMI. Yet actually, as we kind of look at all the data together, we see that one in five of the adults we track, around 20% have multiple risk factors. So more, you know, obviously more than one of these uh, risk factors associated with higher morbidity and mortality associated with COVID-19. Next slide. We also know that these risk factors are not uniform across the population. Um, zooming in just on Cuyahoga County for the moment, uh, Hispanic, Latino, and African-American Black adults are much more likely to carry these multiple risk factors for COVID-19 mor mor morbidity mortality. And unlike white adults, uh, the prevalence of risk factors remains high among these groups, regardless of whether the person lives in a high income uh, or low income neighborhood. Next slide. So due to, the, due to the equity issues surrounding COVID-19, um, we were so lucky that an opportunity came around to work with uh, our region's amazing federally qualified health centers and coordinating their COVID-19 response. We knew from these data that I just showed you that there was a tremendous um, risk uh, facing low income and minority populations in the greater Cleveland area. We also knew that there was a major issue initially in getting tests out to these communities. So last summer, uh, with the leadership uh, led by Kirsten Creation, we began working with our partners with Asia Inc., Care Alliance, the Centers, Neighborhood Family Practice, Neon, and Signature Health to, um, one, convene them all together and share best practices, how to effectively test large numbers of people in the community, and then collect and analyze their COVID-19 testing and eventually vaccine information to help drive data informed decision making around these health centers. Um, this typically is hasn't been what we do, uh, but as Rita mentioned, I think it's all about really finding those opportunities to change and pivot and really kind of do the things we typically do, but in the new situation. In this setting, it's convening and using data to drive decision making. So this 
would not have been possible without the support of each of these FQHCs, obviously, and as well as the Rapid Response Fund. I also want to make sure before I start presenting this, I want to acknowledge the amazing work of the region's health systems, uh, Cleveland Clinic, University Hospitals, and Metro Health, as well as our local health department, uh, Cleveland Department of Health and Cuyahoga County Board of Health. And as you'll see, this collaboration grew and grew as the months followed, as it included more and more stakeholders in the region. And at Better Health, we really just represent a small piece of this work, but we are darn well proud of the work we did here. So I'm really proud to share these upcoming slides. Uh, next slide. So immediately uh, when we began working, we started by pooling the testing data from each FQHC to get a sense of where people uh, that were getting tests lived and where positive tests were coming from and where uh, so-called testing deserts were popping up in the community. This helped the FQs to work together to strategically offer pop-up testing uh, sites. This work then continued on into 2021 uh, due to the leadership of folks at University Hospitals and Cleveland Clinic and the brilliant work at the GIS lab of Dr. Andrew Curtis at Case. Next slide. Then starting in January, when vaccines became available, we again pooled data from the FQs to understand where people were and were not getting vaccinated. We also received data from our partners at CCBH and CDPH, as well as uh, Jamie Carmichael at Ohio Department of Health, really to help us understand where racial and income disparities were largest in the region. And it became quite evident immediately that there, we were not effectively reaching minority populations across greater Cleveland. Next slide. So working as a collaborative, our uh, first step was uh, really taking the data that we collected out to the community. You know, again, not making the decisions in our little Zoom calls, but taking them out to the people who know these communities. So diving into the neighborhoods where either the vaccine numbers were lowest or the disparities were the greatest, we tried to understand why the vaccine wasn't reaching into different parts of the community. So for example, this was a, a map of uh, the central neighborhood and working with our community partners in central with the Promise neighborhood, they were actually able to help us determine which specific CMH housing facility would be the most important to target. And this informed what type of outreaches our uh, partners at Care Alliance then implemented in that neighborhood. Next slide. Next, uh, Greater Cleveland Congregation approached us with a brilliant idea of um, offering vaccinations in churches, which uh, they thought would allow for a more trusted venue for people to feel uh, you know, comfortable coming in and getting vaccinated. We piloted this on the west side with a uh, neighborhood family practice uh, at a Latino Hispanic population and an east side church with the centers with an African American population, both partnering uh, with a, the, the, the Greater Cleveland Congregation and with the FQHC with actually volunteers from all the FQs coming together. And we saw incredible results of reaching the community through this approach. This model expanded to include multiple houses of worship. Uh, we collaborated with Greater Cleveland Congregation, the Hispanic Roundtable, and other groups. Uh, so we used the data from uh, our FQHCs to identify communities with low vaccination rates and then identified nearby houses of worship that could be vent good venues to host events. Then we concocted a, a, a huge network of uh, helpers through partnerships with our local health departments, Ohio Department of Health, the Ohio National Guard. Vaccines were brought in through the event, run by the FQs, administered by the guard, hosted by the church staff, all kind of working in tandem. It was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful setup. Next slide. And this strategy proved to be a really great success. FQHCs began adopting this strategy at more and more events, really, really pushing themselves to try and find new and innovative approaches to get that vaccine out of the clinic and partnering with relevant community groups. So while in the first few months of vaccine availability, FQHCs, like everyone, really struggled to reach minority populations. Yet, as a result of this strategy, uh, due, you know, in part due to this strategy, not entirely, uh, and more, most importantly, due to the amazing efforts and outreaches conducted by each individual FQHC, they were doubling or even tripling their reach into the various communities in just a few months, far outpacing other providers in the county. Next slide. Another endeavor that allowed us to reach out to this population was our launching of the Pathways Hub, as described earlier. Uh, it's launched uh, just right when the pandemic was starting, which was either good or bad timing, depending on, depending on how you look at it. Um, again, for those not aware, the Hub is a care coordination model that works with community health workers, CHWs, and community agencies that connect uh, them to reimbursement from managed care organizations for their work in addressing people's social determinative health needs. Next slide. 
several um, hundred adults and kids have already been enrolled into the hub in just these past few months. And a vast majority of these people have severe underlying needs, whether a need for a job or a home or exhibiting underlying mental health or chronic health needs. I think really the, the takeaway is it's multiple risk factors all inter interacting with each other that allows, it's important for that CHW to work with that person and work with all of their different needs. Next slide. Based on those needs identified by the CHW, the, the CHW will then work uh, what's called a pathway. Uh, so using evidence-based evidence approaches to help resolve the client's needs. Um, over 2,000s of these pathways were worked by CHWs in the county these past few months. By far the most common job of CHW is really just talking and providing education to the person, whether on safe sleep, healthy eating, uh, or as we'll see, ways to protect yourself from COVID-19. The CHW um, helps the person get connected to whatever services they might need. And when certain milestones are met, these pathways are successfully closed, meaning that the need has been met and then the payment from managed care organizations can be connected to the agency. And I think it shows really the hard work of the CHWs that over four in every five of pathways open in these, this, during this pandemic have had a positive outcome. Next slide. In addition to educating, uh, the CHW's uh, you know, really core job is just providing that wayfinding and support to the person in need as they connect to relevant services across the county. These can range from connecting them to food pantries, our you know, Greater Cleveland Food Bank, organizations working on utility assistance, or getting them housing. Um, and the data from the hub can really help us identify where connections to those agencies are strong, you know, where there's a really clear tunnel getting them, and where there may be an issue. For example, you'll notice on this chart at the very bottom, we have a very low success rate of getting people connected to clothing assistance. And uh, Ginny from Carmelo Rose actually brought it up on a previous uh, webinar we held, where a major aspect driving why that, that why those weren't working were, were due to COVID-related restrictions that were being placed on these agencies during the pandemic. So again, really, really keeping people from you know meeting the needs due to sort of these extraneous situations. Next slide. So due to the work with the FQHCs, it was becoming apparent that many testing positive were identifying, again, multiple social needs, and it all, all sometimes led to an inability of them to be able to safely isolate. So we were always on the lookout of you know, finding ways to potentially leverage our CHWs and help support people navigating their COVID diagnosis. So um, we were very lucky uh, to be approached by United Healthcare. They had piloted a model in other cities across the country, kind of a mass testing approach, and they really wanted to bring it to Cleveland. So they used analysis from our FQHC data, and they uh, at UHC identified several neighborhoods on the east side of Cleveland, and they brought together churches from Greater Cleveland Congregation, uh, nearby FQHCs, all in an uh, effort to help supply tests, food, and uh, other, uh, other aspects to a trusted venue for people to access. And uh, just a few uh, short weeks over the Christmas holiday, right when we are experiencing a record surge, over 3,500 people were tested in Eastside Cleveland and given food and other supplies. And you know, very proud of the numbers that UHC achieved with over two thirds of those getting tested were African-American. This was so great. And we were also able to have, and happy to be able to connect CHWs into this workflow. In those testing sites, if people had additional needs or expressed concern about isolating, we were able to link them on site to a CHW and brought them into the hub. And so through this event and then over the, the, the subsequent uh, months and year, CHWs have offered COVID-19 support to over 100 people in the hub, uh, providing education or connecting them to testing or vaccination. So uh, this work is ongoing, but I think it's such a great example of really the value of collaboration of what we're really all about here at Better Health. Uh, next slide. So this is our certificate of participation from the governor, which we're really proud of. But you know, again, really, it's an, it represents the all of the work of these organizations. Um, for many of these organizations, this was our first time working with them. Um, you know, we had to meet via Zoom, which is always very hard, and I really learned. Uh, Good lessons from folks at Greater Cleveland Congregation that these collabor collaboratives have to be built on trust and relations, and they can never, cannot be transactional. That, and this is obviously very hard to, to build trust on Zoom, but you really need to establish that trust before anything else can happen. So we are truly are so lucky to have so many fine federally qualified health centers in the region, and through the hard work 
for groups like Greater Cleveland Congregation, the Hispanic Roundtable, governmental groups like Ohio Department of Health, CCBH, CDPH, the hospital systems, CASE, and gosh, even the National Guard, and of course, the support of the collaboration of funders for the Rapid Response Fund, we were able to make a really a sizable impact on our community. And we've gotten recognition, uh, you know, the, the certificate, uh, a, a New York Times article, the governor highlighted our collaborative in one of his uh, cool afternoon briefings. But all of this really is reflective of the work of the broader collaborative. So we're just thankful to be able to play a small part in it. And uh, obviously the work is ongoing. Unfortunately, we'd like for it to be over, but we, we, we are happy to continue this work as a part of this uh, group. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Chris and Rita. Um, boy, this demonstrates uh, so much of what we've been talking about, um, the importance of the hub model as a sustainable uh, piece of addressing the social needs and, and medical needs of our communities. Uh, the demonstration of the power of partnership in, uh, in our COVID efforts, um, all things that we've been talking about. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, I have uh, now the uh, privilege to uh, introduce Dr. James Mizak and um, Mimi Singh. Uh, uh, Jim is the Chief Medical Officer for the Institute of Hope out of the Metro Health System. Um, Mimi is uh, the Powell Professor of Geriatric Health Education at Case Western Reserve School of Medicine and the Director of Health Professions Education Evaluation and Research, the Research Advanced Fellowship at the VA. Um, we touched a little bit in uh, Rita's talk about uh, how Better Health Partnership has managed to uh, subdivide the work into our leadership teams. We have an adult leadership team, a, a, a children's health leadership team, all of which have subcommittees. Uh, we've addressed our uh, infant and maternal health needs through the first year Cleveland activities. And we have what's called a health metrics advisory committee. And you're gonna be hearing some uh, from some of the work that's been done there that has uh, branched out into uh, addressing the effects of climate change on health. And we'll be hearing from them in a minute. But uh, Dr. Mizak and Singh are gonna talk about the adult uh, leadership team's efforts in addressing racial disparities. And I think the one thing that's important to add before we move on to this talk is just an awareness for the audience that all of the participants in these leadership teams, the subcommittees putting these programs together are volunteers. They have joined forces with us through Better Health Partnership to try to improve the health of the community on their own time with the support of their, their organizations and uh, I am just eternally grateful for all the work that's been done. Jim and Mimi, I turn it over to you. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, kudos to the Better Health team for a terrific collaborative up to this point. It's been a very rich learning experience and thank you so much for putting this together. And also Dr. Ford, congratulations. The cream always rises to the top and we will miss you, but um, I'm sure you're on to bigger and better things at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, if I could have the next slide. Um, Dr. Bowen reviewed some of this um, information already. Um, through the efforts of Better Health Partnership and the collaboration amongst the healthcare providers in Northeast Ohio, we have managed to reduce the gaps in certain aspects of chronic disease care over the course of the last several years. This slide shows um, how gaps, racial disparities and gaps in diabetes care as measured by the four items in the box to the right of the slide have been reduced but not eliminated over the course of the time uh, Better Health Partnership has been collecting data. So while a rising tide lifts all boats, um, some of us are still in leaky rubber rafts and other of us are in yachts. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please. Again, uh, Dr. Bowen reviewed this while uh, because through the implementation of best practices, blood pressure control improved across multiple racial ethnic income um, parameters. Disparities still exist um, as they're shown here. If you look in the middle upper slide by race ethnicity in 2019, um, African-Americans still have much poorer blood pressure control as a whole than white or Latinx uh, communities. If I can have the next slide. Same story with diabetes. Um, 
disparities still persist by race and ethnicity in terms of diabetes control. We're looking here at a measure of poor diabetes control, so lower is better. And as you can see, uh, non-Hispanic whites are doing the best. Um, the Hispanic community is doing the worst. And interestingly enough, these numbers haven't changed a lot over time for much of anybody. Um, I think uh, my own feeling is that the, the COVID pandemic has definitely uh, impacted our ability to, to impact these numbers. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please. So Better Health Partnership uh, pulled together an adult leadership team to try and address the problem of persistent racial, ethnic and income disparities in adult chronic disease care and outcomes. Um, diabetes and hypertension being the two for which we have the most data, but not the only two by any means. So unlike what you've heard um, previously, we are taking much more of a QI approach to this by teeing up a smart aim and then trying to move that QI approach upstream. So our SMART aim is to reduce racial and ethnic disparities by some percent across all PCPs and Better Health Partnerships Collaborative by a certain date. And X and Y have yet to be determined. Uh, this is a work in progress and we certainly would appreciate your, your input in terms of what, these, what X and Y should be. If I can have the next slide, please. This is a very busy slide, but the way we decided to approach achieving this SMART aim was to develop a driver diagram. Um, and those of you who are familiar with driver diagrams know that you, you go from your aim to your primary drivers, to secondary drivers, to change ideas as you move left to right in the diagram. And then hopefully by implementing the change ideas to the right, you then go the reverse direction you know, to influence the secondary drivers, which in turn influence the primary drivers, which in turn influence your SMART aim. Um, the primary drivers that we determined uh, might be most impactful in this are listed in brown. They are the quality of the, the clinical care we deliver, the social determinants of health, the accountabilities of our health systems, and policy. And then we broke each of these down into secondary drivers, which you can see uh, in the middle, and then in turn, uh, tried to tease out change ideas that would influence the secondary drivers, which in turn would influence the primary drivers, which in turn would influence the smart aim. So if I can have the next slide, please. Once we uh, determined our change ideas, we asked everybody in the adult leadership team to rank these change ideas on a two by two matrix, um, assessing what they believed to be their feasibility and their impact. And obviously what you want to do is work on change ideas in the upper right hand quadrant of that two by two matrix, the things that are both have the most feasibility and hopefully will make the most impact. And so we took all the change ideas and ranked them on this two by two matrix. And the next slide shows what we distilled as the three change ideas, priorities that we have chosen to work on in the adult leadership team. And they are, community engagement, social care referrals, and integrated behavioral health. And what we are trying to do now that we've identified these three core change ideas is to identify what are best practices in each of these areas. Um, what metrics can we agree to to measure our progress on these? And how do we share learning and learning collaboratives such as this? And hopefully if we can identify some replicable best practices to which we can attach um, <laughs> measurable metrics and share the learning across the health systems, hopefully we'll make some impact in reducing racial and ethnic disparities in adult chronic disease measures. So that's the plan we are, we are um, following. We are still early in this process. And with the next slide, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Singh, uh, to talk more about where we are now. Sure. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Mizek. So I want to, uh, again, thank you for framing the work that we're doing. And as everybody has been hearing all morning, there is a lot of complexities to what we've taken on as a charge. And I hope um, some of the things that we'll be that I'll be presenting in the next couple of slides will um, reflect that complexity and the very thoughtful work that our adult leadership team has been doing. Um, I will present kind of what we're doing currently as well as kind of our next steps or how, um, how the future looks for us. 
So as um, Dr. Mizex mentioned, we, we've identified three priority areas um, given the, the drivers and the um, thoughtful process that our team has gone through. And now we're asking teams um, on the adult leadership uh, team to share the best practices in these three areas. And the sharing is around these important questions. What are you doing as a system in this in your particular priority area as that you selected as a potential best practice? How are you doing it? Which is of course the most important. What's working well? And of course, with all this work, we know the challenges and opportunities that come up. So share those. And ultimately getting back to this larger question of what are some of the strategies that will help us achieve this aim that we've taken on, which is to reduce disparities in chronic disease. Next slide, please. So this is a table that essentially shares, that's showing how our different team members are sharing the community engagement, integrated behavioral health, and social referrals. The highlighted areas are teams that have already presented and we've, we'll be presenting some of the lessons learned from them. Um, and the uh, other teams are going to be presenting over the next couple of months. We uh, meet monthly. And what I think this does show is that we have um, incredible uh, expertise in all three of these priority areas. I do also wanna mention that a lot of the folks, a lot of our team members have um, can have done excellent work in all three of these priority areas. And we kind of put them in a sticky spot by asking them to pick one based on maturity of uh, projects or maturity of program based on uh, measurement and the effectiveness. So we've, we did kind of pin them down and say, well, pick one, but as you will hear, and as you've been hearing this morning, the, many of them can share um, best practices in all three areas. And um, we're hoping to learn, learn from them. Next slide, please. So here's the real, what are we learning? So we kind of presented the logistics but we're learning a lot. And a lot of this is coming up in the conversations that we've had all morning during this collaborative. And as we've heard from our team members, um, some there are four main elements that are coming up as themes in the category of community engagement. So what are those themes? Level of integration considerations. So how are the community stakeholders incorporated into the healthcare organization? Are they um, are, are they employed? Are they external partners? Are, do they sit on the board? Um, are their patient, um, uh, are patient stakeholders part of the conversation? Um, similarly, decision-making considerations. How is the community feedback and decision-making incorporated into the healthcare organization? And this has really been an eye-opening experience because we've, we've seen that there's a continuum that we community feedback can be simple as surveys, as we've talked about early on, to actually having team members um, part of a regular meeting. And um, as, as mentioned, whether they're kind of high up or at the ground level, how is, that, uh, how is that interface occurring? Next slide, please. The other pieces that we've learned and one that's come up multiple times um, during the morning is trust building. And we've recognized, we've shared through our project, through the programs that um, establishing trusted relationships is really important. We have, um, whether communities have uh, an influential liaison with the, uh, with the healthcare organization. A critical lesson that we're learning is we all too, all too often in healthcare kind of meet people with, where do you need to go? Here are the gaps. But really we should be asking the question, where are you? Where, are, where, are the, where is the community and where they are? and not necessarily going in with our agenda and where they need to be. And then more importantly, healthcare organizations, are they a part of the respect and um, can they effectively deliver? And this really gets back to the, the, the last point, which is do, does the community and the healthcare organization actually share mission and goals? And this is a critical question that's coming up in all of the presentations so far that if the community partners do not see the health core organization on the same page when it comes to value systems, that really does create a barrier to sort of some of the work that's gonna be uh, needed in this area, i.e. in racial, uh, reducing racial disparities. So if the community partners see the healthcare organization as an other and just kind of taking up zip code space, if you will, and not necessarily aligning along the lines of value systems, the conversations are gonna be much more stickier and a lot more uh, uphill battle. I think a simple statement that I would, um, that has come up multiple times when we've talked about this is that if patients and families in the community do not 
do not, they, if patients and families do not care what you know, if they know you do not care. And that is something that we've, we've, rec we've noticed as we've, um, as we've been talking to our partners. Next slide, please. So this is a busy slide, but we want to just show that we are going to continue this conversation. So we shared our community engagement conversations, but similarly, we're going to have um, we're going to have similar co conversations around social uh, referrals as well as integrated uh, behavioral health. And as you can see, we're planning on doing the same thing: sharing best practices, what has worked, what are some of the ways we're operationalizing or measuring, what kind of data will we need? So this gets back to what Better Health partners, what Better Health has done so well, which is transparency of data collection and taking a very methodical QI approach so that when we do disseminate this, people can actually not only contextualize it to their, to their systems, but really get the best out of, um, out of the practices and the strategies. Next slide, please. So ultimately, this question has come up this morning, what does success look like? And this is kind of our aspirational goal, that if we do as a team, as an adult leadership team, share these best practices um, and uh, approach these strategies that we will also, we will ultimately get to an upstream integration and get to our ultimate goal of reducing health disparities. And so what that would look like is patients coming into our healthcare organization, um, well-connected, coordinated care, really meeting both their social and their behavioral needs, that best practices in chronic disease would not just be limited to what we think of as the traditional way, which is just hemoglobin A1Cs and blood pressure control, but really uh, taking into consideration the social components um, in those conversations. And ultimately that this will show up in our quality health outcomes. So I think um, here, I would just say that as a team, we are, we are exploring, we've learned a lot. I think um, this morning's conversation has really led me to think that um, the, that we're validated and reinforced in sort of approaching things with more of a coordination around social and behavioral needs, as well as building trust. And we hope to um, continue that conversation. And next time at a uh, next learning collaborative, present some more specific data around these three priority areas. I think that is the um, last slide. And if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Jim and Mimi. Uh, yes, we do have a few minutes for questions. If anybody would care to put one in the chat, um, we'd be delighted to see if we can answer them. I am, I am uh, really um, impressed and moved by the, by the idea that, that you expressed, Mimi, about um, asking the fundamental question, are we do we share the same goals? Um, if, if we just assume that is a yes, then I, I can't see how we're ever going to have success. Um, not that the goals necessarily are different, but we have to understand those. Um, as such, are, are you, is, is leadership team incorporating, I know this is a work in progress, but um, have you, have you um, designed this to accept that there may be different solutions for different organizations in different communities? Definitely. I think, again, we're, we're exploring and what we've learned just from um, the presentation so far is that context matters. And so I think um, what, you know, some of these strategies will not be, and we've talked about this in our team conversations, is that some of these strategies might work in one community, but may not, or some tweaking will be required based on, um, based on uh, you know, the context. And I think that's one thing I have learned a lot from working with this group is we recognize that, um, that, that need for that flexibility. Because unlike traditional best practices, if you will, which we pr uh, tend to present in our, within the healthcare system, um, you know, one high blood pressure technique might be pretty standard across multiple clinics. I think this work really speaks to the variation in the work. And I really am impressed with how our team has really handled the fact that, well, maybe this will work in this context, but we might have to tweak it based on, you know, another neighborhood and another zip code. So I, I think that is built into the exploration. I'll, um, I don't know if uh, Jim has any comments on that. Yeah, I think even though this slide says uh, best practices, what we're really looking for are better practices that are replicable but flexible, um, given given the nature of what it is we're trying to address. Thank you for that. Uh, there's a question in the chat: Who was involved in the determining of what change drivers are most feasible and what would have the highest impact? 
and how were these individuals recruited? Should we tell them about the press gang where we hit people over the head? And the large, the large bribes that we offered. Yeah, let's just talk about that. No, I said you're volunteers. Come on. <laughs> um, Jim, did you want to? Um, I think, uh, well, actually, I would ask uh, Rita maybe to weigh in on this as to how the, how the uh, constituent organizations were asked to participate. Well, thanks, Jim. <laughs> thanks, Jim and Mimi, both of you. Um, so our adult health leadership team, when, when it starts to get formed by those who are submitting data to us and who have um, worked with us over the years, know our model well, and want to make that difference, really in the community and the lives of so many people living in Northeast Ohio. So through that process, um, I think the, the question being asked in the chat is really, you know, who, who weighed in on those change ideas? It was everybody, everybody. And when we didn't get answers by email, we called people <laughs> and we chased people until we had everybody's input on this um, so that we were able to in fact determine what the, what, what the group felt most importantly, what can they work on collectively that they can't just accomplish in their silo alone? I think that's a really important point to make. Um, really staying focused on the collective impact of the group and what would carry us forward. And so it was really important that everybody, everybody had a voice in that decision and that prioritization process. I hope I answered that person's question. And I think it's really clear to all of us, this is an approach from the health system out. So at best, it's complementary to everything else we've been talking about this morning. In no way is this sufficient on its own. A comment from Pamela Murphy, need more African-American providers. Um, I would just say you're absolutely correct and that's something we strive for on our committees at the, on, on the staff level of Better Health Partnership, certainly on our board level. And, and in all the work that we do. And I appreciate the reminder. Um, question from, or comment from Amy Scheidler, uh, funding discrepancies between health systems and CBOs create a gap between social determinants of health screening and intervention. Are there plans to identify other for funding sources to enhance gap closure of social needs? Yes. Um. I can start. Yes, I think the the astounding answer is yes, and I think some of the work that we're doing, and again, as Jim mentioned, this is this is part of it. This, in many ways, we're kind of bringing the healthcare organizations, if you will, to the to kind of hand holding them through this process, if you will. And I want by saying that I mean a lot of the discussions we have in our healthcare organization is around we need data, we need collection, you know, what, how does this operationalize? And I think some of the work the adult leadership team is doing is that we recognize a lot of this, uh, the critical nature of SDH on these um, health outcomes, but translating it and kind of getting it to so we can get funding and things requ requires a little bit uh, along uh, data collection and data um, assessment. And that's the piece that we hope to bridge. So of course, we, we would love to, um, you know, to, to get more funding and especially when we can get some of these gaps um, uh, better identified. So I think that's, a, that's, a, that's the ultimate goal, if not one of the main goals, yes. I don't know Great. Oh, well, let me let me just move to our last question quickly. Um, the asking about uh, the role of the Unitas platform in the integration framework, and I suspect that with the matrix that you showed, Mimi, that's that's going to be a, a significant part of that. Yes, I, Jim might want to comment on that. Yeah. Yes. Um, as of as of now, um, Metro Health and the Cleveland Clinic are part of the Unite Ohio network, which links healthcare systems and community-based organizations via an electronic plat resource referral platform called Unite Us into a network called Unite Ohio. We currently have over 140 community-based organizations as part of the Unite Ohio network. And so I think it is a really powerful tool for allowing communication, not just between healthcare providers and community-based organizations, but among community-based organizations to meet the health-related social needs of individuals. Now, again, communication is only a piece of the puzzle. Um, how the CBOs get paid for the work they do is an example of what economists call the wrong pocket problem, right? That the, the, the work is being done here, but the benefits are accruing there. And, uh, you know, there's a ton of work being done nationwide right now to try and solve this problem. 
Um, but it's but it's a sticky wicket. And Unite Ohio, I think, opens up some possibilities to solve that problem, but in and of itself does not. Terrific. Um, heartfelt thanks to both of you for your leadership in, in this important work. You've you've herded cats, you've uh, you've untangled uh, balls of string. Um, you've given direction to something that is huge and and deeply important. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please. Now we move on to another topic that has uh, engaged a lot of the efforts of Better Health Partnership over the past year plus, um, addressing climate change in health. I mentioned that uh, this has been a focus of our Health Metrics Advisory Committee that really is focusing on bridging the gap between understanding uh, the data surrounding the social determinants of health and the impact on health. And, and choosing the topic of climate change and health has been fairly obvious as, as, as to the need. Um, rich supplies of data in both spheres, but bringing those together has been a tremendous challenge. So to start us off in this conversation, I'm uh, delighted to be able to introduce Dr. Ash Segal. He's Director of Research and Evaluation, the Institute of Hope, Co-Director for the Center for Reducing Health Disparities and the Duncan Neuhauser Professor of Community Health Improvement at Case Western Reserve University through the Metro Health System. Dr. Sagal. Good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. So there's uh, three ideas I want uh, you to take away from uh, this presentation. The first is that health systems will have to deal with the health impacts of climate change. The second is that health systems themselves are contributing to climate change. And the third is that the quality improvement approach that Better Health Partnership uses might be able to help us with both of these challenges. Next slide. Here are the things I'm gonna cover in my presentation. The mechanisms of climate change, the health impacts of climate change, what we're doing in our Northeast Ohio health system collaboration, and then some final thoughts. So our health system collaboration includes both a physician and an energy manager from these five health systems, Metro Health, Akron Children's, Cleveland Clinic, the Cleveland VA, and University Hospitals. Next slide. So here's a simple way to think about the mechanisms of climate change. So we have uh, solar energy that comes in from outer space and is absorbed by the Earth's surface. That's indicated by the large orange arrow in the diagram. But then some of the solar energy is radiated back towards outer space. That's the middle orange arrow in the diagram. Now the key here is that that radiated solar energy is radiated at a longer wavelength at an infrared wavelength than the incoming solar radiation. And unfortunately for us, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, such as methane and nitrous oxide, absorb some of this infrared energy and therefore limit the radiation back to space. So the net result of all this process is that the temperature of the surface of the earth increases. Next slide. Now there's a urgency about this uh, climate change crisis because carbon dioxide levels have increased from 280 in uh, pre-industrial times to 413 now. So quite a sizable increase. And experts say that to limit the further, substantial further increases, we need to cut our carbon emissions, our carbon dioxide emissions by 50% in the next decade and to be carbon neutral by 2050. In other words, not having any net addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Next slide. So that's a bit about the mechanisms of climate change. Now let's talk about the health impacts of climate change. Next slide. These are some of the major climate hazards due to climate change. Increased temperature, wildfires and air pollution, storms and floods, 
and droughts. Next slide. So the increased temperature that results due to climate change can cause dehydration, fatigue, heat stroke, and kidney disease, among other problems. And this is especially a problem. Of, this is especially a problem for people who have to work outdoors in hot weather, such as these farmers in this picture. Next slide. The higher temperatures also increase wildfires, mold, pollen, and other pollutants. You wouldn't be surprised to learn that air pollution results in increases in asthma and allergies. But it turns out that air pollution also is a significant contributor to cardiovascular disease and mortality. Here's a photograph of a recent wildfire in Australia. Next slide. Now the warming that results from increased temperatures, increased temperatures increases evaporation, which results in more storms and floods and more severe storms and floods. This is a photograph of Hurricane Maria as it was approaching Puerto Rico. This hurricane resulted in many injuries and deaths and as adverse effects on mental health. Next slide. Now the increased temperature and the increased evaporation causes storms and floods in some areas, but causes droughts in others. These droughts can reduce freshwater supplies and agricultural production, which lead to malnutrition and diarrheal diseases. Here's a photo of a drought affecting a cornfield. Next slide. So all of these health hazards are gonna have an impact on healthcare systems because they're gonna change the prevalence and the geographic spread of illnesses. Extreme weather can also disrupt utilities, transportation and communication systems. This is a photo of a hospital that was flooded due to Hurricane Katrina. Now, not only will healthcare systems have to deal with the impacts of climate change, it turns out that they also contribute to climate change because they, they emit substantial amounts of greenhouse gases. Uh, in the US, it's estimated that 10% of all greenhouse gases come from the healthcare sector. Next slide. Let me tell you now a little bit about what we're doing in our health system collaboration. Next slide. So the five health systems that are in our collaboration are doing the following things. We've uh, begun to share our energy use data and then we hope to use quality improvement methods to try to understand and reduce our carbon footprints. Next slide. Here's an example of the data that we're sharing. This uh, slide shows the emissions related to energy use at our five health systems. And you can see that the numbers vary from 21 to 24 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per 1,000 square feet of building space that were emitted by our health systems in the year 2020. Next slide. We're also looking at where the energy emissions are coming from. This is one of the health systems, but the other health systems had very similar uh, results. So in terms of greenhouse gas emissions related to energy use, about two thirds of that comes from electricity and about one third comes from natural gas. Next slide. We're also looking at changes over time. This is what happened to our energy related emissions from 2019 to 2020. And you can see that there were either small decreases or small increases in energy related emissions at our health systems from 2019 to 2020. Remember I said earlier that our goal should be to cut emissions 50% by the year 2030. To reach that goal, we need to have a seven and a half percent decrease year over year. In other words, 2021 needs to be seven and a half percent lower than 2020 and 2022 needs to be seven and a half percent lower than 2021 and so forth. So you can see that uh, compared to what we need to be doing what we're actually doing is, is not, not as much. 
Next slide. Here's what we plan to do next in our collaboration. Uh, we plan to identify best practices to reduce energy use. We plan to examine emissions related to supplies and services. And we plan to help our health systems prepare for climate sensitive health conditions such as asthma, COPD, and allergies. Next slide. And then I'll conclude with a few final thoughts. So uh, when you think about the health impacts of climate change, I want you to keep this diagram in mind. So we're burning fossil fuels that releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that results in climate change. Climate change creates hazards such as wildfires and those hazards have health impacts such as asthma. Next slide. Now in the context of climate change, the term mitigation means doing something to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. So for example, if we got our electricity from solar and wind instead of from coal fired power plants, that would reduce our carbon dioxide emissions and that would be an example of mitigation. In the context of climate change, adaptation means trying to adjust to the effects of climate change. So for example, if we told our asthmatic patients to stay indoors when the outdoor air quality was bad, that would be an example of adaptation. And of course, we all know what suffering means. And our future is gonna be a combination of these three things, mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. What we don't know is how much of each of those, these three things are, are in store for us in the future. And it's important for us to spend, to, to, to work as hard as we can to focus on mitigation and that adaptation so that we can uh, limit suffering. Next slide. If you're interested in this topic, I'd suggest that you pick a climate hazard or health impact, review what's already been done in that area, and then decide where you can contribute. You might want to educate the public or policymakers or health providers about this topic. You might wanna implement programs in your practice or your health system. You might wanna conduct research to address gaps in our knowledge. And uh, most important, I think we all need to, as citizens and consumers, to push our governments and our corporations to dramatically reduce uh, our, our society's uh, carbon footprints. We actually already have the technology to do this. And uh, the cost of energy from re renewable sources is now already either comparable to or cheaper than energy from fossil fuel sources. But we need to have the political will to make these changes. Next slide. Here's my final slide. Uh, here's some resources that might be uh, helpful to you. There's an organization called Ohio Clinicians for Climate Action, which is doing a lot of great work in this area. There's a new journal called the Journal of Climate Change and Health that I'm on the editorial board of. It's a free online journal that you can access uh, uh, easily online. Uh, there are three newsletters that I recommend. You can Google these uh, names and sign up to receive an email once a week or every few days from these uh, 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 sources that'll help you keep on top of the latest developments. And then I have my email address there if you have any questions or if there's anything I can help you with, uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, and with that, I will um, turn it back over to, uh, to Don. Thank you so much, Ash. Um, thanks for, for uh, spelling out the concern so clearly to us. Um, I'm going to move on to our next speaker. Hopefully, we'll have time at the end for some questions. If you can stick around, Ash, see if anybody has any questions. Um, now I get to introduce Sarah O'Keefe, who's the Director of Sustainability for the Metro Health System. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I am so grateful to be here as a part of the Learning Collaborative today, and especially thanks to Ash Sagal for bringing the Northeast Ohio Health Systems and Climate Change Group together uh, through the Better Health Partnership. And thank you also, Rita, for your leadership there. I am excited to be a part of the Learning Collaborative today and to share a resource that I think other healthcare anchor institutions or healthcare organizations might be interested in. Uh, next slide, please. 
This resource comes from Practice Green Health, which is a national healthcare, sustainable healthcare organizations that hospitals and healthcare institutions belong to. Uh, it is basically um, a connection, a tool that connects our health and our energy use. Ash spoke a lot about the, um, the fact that health in, healthcare institutions need to deal with the health impacts of climate change, but also emphasized, of course, that we ourselves as healthcare anchors um, and healthcare systems are contributors to climate change. And I find that a very empowering fact because that means that we have a lot of potential impact, positive impact on climate change. So these are talking points for healthcare anchors that are really seeking to take action on climate and health. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, digging a little deeper, Ash mentioned that 10% of greenhouse gas emissions are in the healthcare sector, with over one third of those emissions actually coming from hospitals themselves. And this is one kind of cost, right? We are talking about the climate emissions and the health, the cascade effect and those health impacts down the line. But in addition to that, we are also have a financial and a more immediate cost in terms of air pollution. So we use as hospitals, actually healthcare sector spaces use 2.5 times more energy per square foot than an office building of the same size. And annually we spend about $9.5 billion on energy each year as a healthcare sector. So as we contribute to both decreased air quality and climate change as a large energy user, we can think about our decisions on energy in terms of our health mission. Next slide, please. Here you have a graphic that's rather small, I apologize for that, but if you'd like to delve deeper into it, it's at healthy, healthyenergyinitiative.org. And it shows not only the cascading effect of climate change, but this specifically looks at energy production and how the environmental disruptions from energy production, such as extraction, transport, processing, distribution, and waste disposal cause environmental disruptions, such as air emissions, air pollution, water use, land use, and eventually trickle over to the health, human health outcomes, life expectancy, quality of life, physical and mental health, and of course, health equity. Now, the cleanest form of energy that we use is that the, the unit that we reduce, right? So the cleanest form of energy is energy not used. And when we think about our energy choices, as Ash already mentioned in this collaborative, we're thinking about reducing opportunities to reduce our energy use, reduce the immediate health and environmental impacts of energy production, but also that cascading effect of climate emissions. Additionally, of course, we have, depending on the margin for a nonprofit healthcare organization, for every dollar that's not spent on energy or that's saved on energy is equivalent to generating at least $20 in new patient revenue, which helps us, of course, um, on the financial side, but also we can divert those savings to patient care, ultimately. I wanna just go a little bit more locally. Next slide, please. And think about energy and our health and our energy health decisions. Um, related to a more local scenario. So in Cuyahoga County, we have some population statistics here that I pulled from the American Lung Association. And these are related to diseases related to air quality. We have the county population of 1.2 million, and then we have various demographics, youth under 18. These are counts of individuals, uh, elderly over 65, those of poverty and uh, people of color alongside of the number of individuals that have pediatric and adult asthma or CP, COPD, lung cancer, cardiovascular disease. And we wanna think about this context as, um, for example, healthcare institutions who might have service area in Cuyahoga County. Go ahead, next slide. And this ties, of course, to our own assessment of uh, community health needs in Cuyahoga County if you can see the five priority areas that were the focus for 2019 through 2022, I'd like to make the connection between at least three of them specifically to energy use and decisions and thinking about health. So we have reducing chronic illnesses at the bottom and its effects. We already heard about asthma, COPD, and cardiovascular disease, and the use of energy production and climate change and the impacts on air, air pollution that can impact these diseases. But we also heard a lot today about enhancing trust and trustworthiness across sectors in amongst people and in our communities. 
So this is anchor mission resonant, right? As large energy users, as healthcare anchor institutions, we have that potential to have a large impact. And of course, uh, on eliminating structural racism, we know that black people, indig indigenous and people of color individuals are more often exposed to air pollution in their communities due to various factors that we've all learned about today or discussed today. Next slide. So while we have the context of what the impacts are on health when we think about energy use and the health impacts from the energy production and eventually the health impacts that come from climate change because we are using fossil fuel generated energy, it, it helps to think about another way to quantify those. How do we quantify them? Until recently, there wasn't really a great tool for this, but Practice Green Health has a tool called the Energy and Health Impact Calculator. I'm just gonna go over fairly briefly how it works because I don't wanna get into too much detail, but you can go to this website, you can download it even if you're not a member, if your healthcare organization is not a member, you can download it and use it. Basically, you download the tool, it's an Excel spreadsheet, you input energy data for your health system or healthcare, uh, healthcare anchor building, and then the energy data is converted to emissions results. And that emissions re those emission results are then use various resources listed below here on this slide to calculate the health and welfare impacts of those emissions. And then those health and welfare impacts incidences are assigned a value based on a lot of different uh, studies and research that you can find as a part of the tool. And you ultimately get results as a user and you can use these results in discussions with your peers, with your senior leadership at your healthcare institution, for example, to think about what, how you want to impact, um, take perhaps uh, action on energy use efficiency and maybe the kind of energy that you're using. Next slide. So in this example, hospital that Practice Green Health has in its tool, if you were to download this tool, you would see uh, this is one of the outputs. So this is a total health results table. It's basically taking all the energy, quantifying incident values and incidents per year in these various categories like premature death, hospital admissions, asthma exacerbation, respiratory symptoms, non-fatal heart attacks, ER visits, but also in the social costs of carbon, work loss and restricted days and incidences of uh, mercury related incidences. Ultimately, the quantification for this hospital, which uses fossil fuel generated electricity was about $42 million uh, socially uh, for to society, the cost to society. The direct medical costs were around $173,000. So due to dispersal patterns, there's a note here, um, social determinants of health and other environmental health factors, these health impacts and cost of emissions cannot really be attributed to a given location or population. I can't say this is exactly happening in um, Cuyahoga County because our energy that's generated, for example, our electricity might not be generated in Cleveland, Ohio. It might be generated in Indiana or Pennsylvania. However, even though we can't ascribe the impacts to the specific geography, our healthcare, our healthcare mission really doesn't have a geographical limit. So I think that's an important thing to note. Next slide. And just to emphasize uh, Ash's earlier point, you saw that at 65% of the emissions that come from an um, area, one of the hospitals that we are part of the, our group, 65% of the emissions come from electricity. In this case as well, for a fossil fuel um, generated electricity, this hospital, 85% of the total incident value um, for its energy use comes from the electricity side. And this is because it's fossil fuel generated. I think that's a very important point was we look to um, take action and electricity becomes an opportunity. Next slide. Meanwhile, delivered fuels like natural gas, fuel oil, um, diesel oil for backup generators is a much smaller portion of the overall quantification of this incidence. Next slide. And here they have, you can see it side by side, basically the total incident value when you compare the emissions from electricity versus the emissions from delivered fuels and the value of those incidents. So purchase electricity really becomes a great value. Opportunity, oh, next slide. And this is the actual emissions from the, in, the energy that was uh, put into this calculator. You can see here, the inputs were on electricity and natural gas for this particular example, but you could also input fuel oil, 
distillate number two, number four, number six, and then propane, district steam, coal, if, if you burn coal still in your um, utility plant, for example. I think most of ours use natural gas now, which is great. So these show the emissions, but it also shows you the equivalency of these emissions as if uh, more in layman's terms, if you would. So the emissions for this hospital, for example, are the same, are equivalent to 1.4 gallons of gasoline being consumed in a year or the power um, of 2000 homes electricity use in one year. So that kind of puts it into terms. So what do we do with this kind of information now that we know, for example, electricity and energy use has these kinds of impacts? Next slide. There are of course lots of opportunities, but again, going back to my first, one of our first points and Ash mentioned it as well, decreasing energy use first is really one of the primary steps for decreasing emissions, both in terms of contribute contribution to climate change and also air pollutants. So uh, John Utek, who's next, is gonna talk a lot about a specific example and case study and go into detail on the opportunities there and what they look like in real life. And then I think after energy efficiency, it's important to talk about, especially in this particular case, renewable electricity as an option. When we see electricity contributing to all of these different um, emissions, then it becomes an immediate opportunity there are lots of different ways to achieve that, of course, and there are lots of different goals to join or um, both regionally, locally, and nationally. And I will just tell you that when we put our own Metro Health's energy usage into this calculator, we saw that if we were to convert 50% of our electricity, not energy, I should say electricity there, 50% of our electricity to renewable, we saw a 40, we would see a 40 to 50% reduction in the incident value of those health results. Um, that this calculator shows. So it's a very exciting kind of tool. It's very actionable and tangible uh, to have in discussion. And it's more of a conversation starter than an endpoint. But I just wanted to share that with the group today. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, uh, I will now introduce John Utek, who's the Senior Director of Sustainability for the Office of Sustainability, Buildings and Design at Cleveland Clinic. John? Thank you. Uh, ne next slide, please. I'm going to start with thanking Ash and the Better Health Partnership for organizing uh, what I think is a, a very, you know, forward thinking and national leading partnership around sharing sort of carbon as a as a quality improvement uh, opportunity within Northeast Ohio and beyond. Uh, Ash framed it at a high level. Sarah did sort of talked about the health impacts. I'm going to share a couple of ways that I frame this within my organization and then share some examples of work we've done to reduce and, work and minimize our carbon footprint. So one way that I talk about it is that sustainability, broadly speaking, is responsible air pollution, uh, pollution of water and soil is responsible for about a quarter of deaths globally, according to World Health Study in 2017, and 10% of U.S. deaths uh, related to the built environment and environmental quality according to a study done in Wisconsin. Next slide, please. So our office was founded in 2007 and it's really through about a decade's worth of work, we built up to the point where Cleveland Clinic committed to a carbon neutral goal in 2017, <clears throat> uh, building on success in energy efficiency and realizing the uh, impact and importance of climate to human health in Ohio and to the world. Next slide. And really, I, I created this about 2014, 15 timeframe to think about and communicate different strategies that, that different healthcare systems can use to think about climate change and the effects that they can have. Um, this is adapted from a model from the, from the IPCC, but really the concept here is that Human interference is causing climate change, as Ash talked about, which is causing all different kinds of impacts and vulnerabilities. And really, we as healthcare systems <clears throat> can mitigate our own footprint, reducing the, uh, you know, reducing the cycle. Some level of change is already inevitable, so we need to plan for adaptations to different vulnerabilities and impacts, <clears throat> both for our patients and for the operation of our healthcare systems. We need to change the way we're practicing medicine to uh, account for the health impacts that we're seeing present right now. 
And then there's also the possibility that we can advocate for policies that would accelerate all of these things. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> we have uh, a number of people, including Dr. Ford and others have talked about the importance of partnerships. This slide is just to highlight some of the really important partnerships that we've had at Cleveland Clinic to uh, work on mitigation, adaptation, advocacy, and the clinical impacts. That's why I was so excited about the Better Health Partnership as a very localized way of working on this, but we work with Department of Energy, Health and Human Services, Healthcare Without Harm, UN Global Compact, Ohio Hospital Association. There's lots of collaborative groups that are all taking different pieces and parts of this. Really the only way that we solve this problem is through collective change. Next slide, please. So don't want to go too deep on this one, but just to talk a little bit about what a carbon footprint is, because not everyone knows what it is. Uh, and I have the uh, inevitable distinction of being trained as a carbon accountant back in 2008. So they divide emissions into three scopes, depending exactly on who really different types of ownerships of those emissions. So scope one is you own an asset that, that emits greenhouse gas. And in healthcare, that is typically things in Northeast Ohio, we burn natural gas to create steam and heat our buildings. We own vehicles that combust fuel. Uh, there's refrigerants. And actually the anesthetic gas that we use in surgeries are greenhouse gases as well. Next slide. Scope two is uh, someone else owns the asset, but you're sort of directly responsible for the usage of that within your building. So that's purchase electricity, purchase steam, or chilled water. We buy and other healthcare systems in this collaborative, uh, in, the, in the partnership, um, purchase energy from the grid in Ohio. We don't own the power plants, but we use the energy and we can control that. That's scope two emissions. Next slide. Scope three is everything else. Everything else is a lot. It's everything we buy. It's the investments in our endowments. Uh, it's all the building that we make. It's commuting. It's, it's sort of a whole host of issues. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Next slide, please. So within Cleveland Clinic, scope one is um, about 25% of our footprint. Anesthetic gases are 2%, burning of natural fuels and, and gasoline and diesel fuel 23, and then the rest is electricity. Next slide. We have been working with Healthcare Without Harm to, and I actually worked with Healthcare Without Harm to create a tool to calculate carbon footprints. We've done the same thing with the Better Health Partnership. And there has been work to develop a scope three tool so I'm sharing this just to sort of give you a sense of the relative magnitude of things. These are two different systems that were in a pilot group. Cleveland Clinic is one of them. Um, the blue bars are purchased goods and services. The green bar are, is investments. Uh, red is capital goods. Uh, this is commuting. So really the top four are the things we buy, the investments we make, our construction, and then commuting. And then there's, there's a bunch of other things as well. Next slide. So in the time left, I'm going to primarily focus on things that we have done at Cleveland Clinic to reduce our footprint. As Ash mentioned, this, this week at the Communication on Progress in Glasgow, there's a talk about how do we accelerate progress towards getting to net zero. <clears throat> and there's been discussion in a lot of groups about getting to a 50% reduction in carbon footprint by 2030. As Ash said, we're gonna to need to accelerate progress. So one point of discussion within the partnership is gonna be some of these items, because as Sarah said, the best energy you can use is the one you don't use. So getting rid of energy in the first place is the, sort of the first step of the solution. And here at the, at the right are strategies that Cleveland Clinic has implemented across its whole enterprise, about 20 million square feet of buildings and we reduced our energy usage about 26% from 2010 to 2020. Next slide. We've actually partnered with the DOE uh, at the national level on this topic, along with other healthcare systems that have made this commitment. And um, 
for those reporting their reduction, Cleveland Clinic had the highest reduction of any healthcare system in what the Department of Energy is calling the Better Buildings Challenge. Next slide. So uh, that's all really good. And if you look from 2000, these, this, these, in, in this chart, the big bars is Cleveland Clinic's enterprise carbon footprint. The red line is our intensity on a per square foot basis. So the amount of real estate we've had has grown a bit. <clears throat> so we've actually taken our intensity down 23% while our total footprint is down 25%. And if you look at the drivers of that, energy efficiency is the biggest part of it. More fuel efficient vehicles is another part. Anesthetic gases is, is, is another. And then the green has become greater as well. <clears throat> but as we look out to reaching our goal by 2027, we definitely need to do more efficiency. We need to build better buildings, but we do need to, as Sarah was talking about, <clears throat> part of the, there are limitations to how far healthcare systems can reduce their energy usage based on just the acute needs for energy in a building and the regulations that, that, uh, that, that bound that usage. So certainly sourcing renewable energy uh, is gonna be part of that solution. Next slide. Um, so just in the, in the continuous improvement mindset, this is a Pareto chart of the sources of the reduction in 26%. Um, the biggest con contributors to our reduction were when we built better buildings, we built them more efficiently than our predecessors. And I know other healthcare systems are building new buildings with that in mind, but that's actually the biggest thing that we did towards this is just when we built new buildings, we built them better than their predecessors. We upgraded the biggest LED lighting retrofit in all of healthcare. We use less energy on our operating rooms and labs. We put energy efficiency thinking into our equipment upgrades, we encourage better behavior. And then we just turned a bunch of things off and retro commission equipment. Next slide. <clears throat> so we have, uh, you know, Cleveland Clinic's built uh, 18 different buildings that have achieved LEED certification, which has energy as a fundamental component. There's just a list of what some of those are. Next slide. Um, this is one that I think could be a really interesting collaboration point for uh, better health is, and I think there already has been some collaboration on this topic within Northeast Ohio, but LED lights have become cost effective, payback is quick. And so we started a project in, in 2014 and now <clears throat> within Cleveland Clinic, uh, reduced more than 500,000 cans and tubes. Um, as part of this, tried to have a social impact in that two of the businesses we used for these retrofits were, were diverse. Um, one female owned, one minority. Um, and we, per we procured some of these things actually made in Northeast Ohio. So, uh, you know, this is a, you know, in terms of reducing energy impact, we can have some social impact as well through manufacturing and installation job creation. Next slide. <clears throat> and I know there's a number of clinicians online. Um, there's, there's very strict regulations that regulate the usage of energy within a healthcare building. Um, so we optimize the usage of that energy uh, in certain buildings, we were exceeding the guidelines by forming a green, the OR committee and getting surgeons, administrators and nurses to support this. We implemented a program to meet those guidelines, saving $2 million and reducing our energy footprint. Next slide. And we did that by, um, <clears throat> you know, putting monitors in rooms where this was taking place so that people could see that while we were, when buildings weren't being used, using less energy, we, they were kind of in range. When, the, when those operating rooms and labs and procedure rooms were being used. Next slide. And we have put in you know, systems to give our, uh, our facilities engineers visibility and all the different things that we're doing from an energy perspective. Next slide. <clears throat> so in terms of you know, what, can, what can hospital administrators do? What can, what can physicians and nurses and all those that occupy all different kinds of healthcare buildings across Northeast Ohio. Behavior is a big part of, of how we can impact energy. Certainly there are buildings where, you know, the request of a, of a senior doctor or a certain important person causes a whole building's energy usage to change based on trying to cool 
a small space within one room. So we've done all kinds of communication around keeping buildings within temperature ranges, removing space heaters, using clothing to modify temperature as opposed to, as opposed to using the thermostat. So everyone who's in a healthcare building every day can make a small contribution towards our climate goals by complying and helping with this kind of behavior. Next slide. Uh, we worked with our EHS to create space heaters become very controversial and sometimes people are chilly. So we actually went to the length of declaring space heaters an unauthorized appliance so that people that are going and doing walkthroughs can actually remove those and uh, from our buildings. Next slide. And then we try to use um, humor and uh, sort of make it a bit fun in terms of, you know, temperature can become a very controversial thing. So having quarter, you know, leadership at the high level and, and ground level supporting the work is, is fundamentally important for success. Next slide. We, we've created an energy training. So any caregiver who joins Cleveland Clinic gets a training on the importance of our energy goal, the health impacts, and training on the behaviors that I just identified. <clears throat> we published a case study on this uh, through Healthier Hospitals Initiative that I can share. <clears throat> so that, because reaching our you know, 70,000 caregivers is challenging. So we've actually built it into an online training environment to try to educate people on how to do this. Next slide. Um, and we do different outreach events, Earth Day, uh, Lab, we have a thing called Lab Palooza to also educate everyone the role they can play in reducing energy and carbon footprint. Next slide. Another action point for healthcare systems is improving vehicle fuel efficiency. So we've made a commitment to use uh, vehicles and purchase vehicles that use less gasoline. This conversation is evolving to buying electric vehicles as opposed to just more fuel efficient gasoline and diesel cars. But we have in the last decade improved vehicle fuel efficiency by 44%. And this is miles per gallon, 2010 to 2021. Next slide. And then anesthetic guesses. So for those involved in, in the different aspects of healthcare that have surgery, um, there's really, we've reduced our anesthetic gas footprint, which is down to 2% of our total footprint, 31% in the last decade. We eliminated desflurane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. And we've implemented low flow things to reduce the amount of anesthetic gas administered to patients, keeping them clinically safe but using the appropriate amount of, of anesthetic agent. Next slide. And then finally, um, you know, Sarah touched on this. So we, you know, proud that we've done good work. Very, very excited to collaborate about the ways that we can implement these kinds of energy efficiencies across Northeast Ohio. Um, and then there's additional collaborative opportunities around uh, procuring on-site renewable energy Offsite renewable energy, which is you know, procuring from large systems or other types of buys. Um, other options are purchasing renewable energy credits and carbon offsets to try to, to try to mitigate our footprint. And then finally, we can engage our suppliers and the ways that we procure. There's a very interesting body of work unpacking the carbon impacts of different drugs or different procedures. And a number of physicians are leading the way in terms of arming our caregivers with how the choices they make on a day-to-day -day basis can impact the carbon footprint of healthcare. So very exciting, expanding group of, of space that really impacts all of you on the call. And I'm happy to share uh, some of just a case study of some of the uh, opportunities uh, uh, that we see today. Next slide. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, John, and thanks uh, to all of our presenters on this on this really important topic. Uh, I'll just note that you you were able to trim 7.5 percent of the time of this presentation from what was allotted. So, I think we're on our way to uh, to uh, um, um, zero net growth in terms of the length of our learning collaboratives. Um, I would invite any questions in the chat. Um, there's so much here. Um, Boy, this uh, this this seems like such a vast problem, and 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 yet, you've all demonstrated uh, that there are ways that we can actually make impact. 
Um, as a clinician myself, I might turn this back to Ash and just uh, just see if you can comment on the, the idea that um, you, you brought this up and, and we talked about this in one of our health metrics advisory committee meetings about this, this idea of how do we prepare our, uh, our patients for climate change? We need to address climate change. We need to address it ourselves in our organizations and on our, our own carbon footprint, whether it's at work or at home. Um, we can't we can't act as if it's not something that our, our patients are dealing with. Can you say a little bit more about that from, from the clinical side? What are the, what are the approaches that we can take to, to really um, strengthen, improve the resilience of our patients in the face of what we understand to be happening around us? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I think if a patient has a climate sensitive health condition like uh, asthma or COPD or uh, uh, allergies, then there's two things that clinicians should do. One is that they should uh, educate patients about the link between climate change and their health condition. Uh, and then the second thing uh, they should do is talk to their patients about specific things that the patients can do to help them adapt to the effects of climate change. So in the case of asthma, it might be teaching the patients how they can look up what the air quality is like on a particular day online, and then what they might wanna do in terms of um, you know, staying indoors or wearing a mask if they go outdoors or being extra cautious about uh, exercising. Um, so I think that there's uh, uh, you know, two areas. One is uh, educating them about climate change in general. And then second is, um, thinking about specific things that patients could, can do to reduce the, the impact of uh, climate change on their particular condition. Thank you so much. Um, I'll, I'll uh, read a question from the chat um, about, this is from Lauren Anthes. Uh, how do systems manage food waste? Um, have you partnered with local organizations, uh, e.g. Rust Belt Riders, to manage your food management in a cyclical way, um, procure from farms who use the compost from your waste, et cetera. That might be uh, something that John or Sarah could address. John, go for it. So uh, Rust Belt Riders is, is a partner of ours in some, candidly, not all of our hospitals. But uh, interestingly, they were funded by, there's, there's a group called Cleveland Climate Action Fund. So they got some seed money for some of their work from a local climate action fund. Uh, that's just another cool little story, but they have grown up in their, their incredibly capable composted food. So at our main campus, we use Rust Belt Riders to compost our food waste. And we do purchase back the compost. We, we do tree plantings. That's something I didn't talk about, but we actually use that composted food waste in planting trees uh, in, in the Fairfax and Huff communities in the last, um, in the last year. And on the Metro Health side, we have partnered with Rust Belt Riders to run a pilot program for composting out of our kitchen area. And we're looking at that and seeing if we can uh, scale it up potentially with Rust Belt or another provider when our new hospital tower is completed with our new kitchen, et cetera. So stay tuned. Thank you. Um, there's been appreciation in the chat also about the participation of the, the five health systems in, in the work that's being looked at here. Uh, we have a number of different organizations represented in our audience today. Um, I, I am impressed at uh, the dedication of, of these uh, healthcare anchor institutions to not only address these problems, but to, to um, make sure that there is staff, that there are, there are professionals who are working in these areas and addressing these problems. Do you have any thoughts for other organizations about how they might be able to establish departments or, or parts of their organization such as you have? I'll take this first. Uh, so we, I, I love this question. I think when I first came in, I'm the first director of sustainability for the Metro Health System from since January of 2018. And when I arrived, everybody said, oh, you can do sustainability. And I was like, oh, it's not just me. <laughs> so I think that's a, a first start is that even though I have the designation of director for sustainability, 
I have uh, convened an interdisciplinary sustainability advisory council from across, and then a few members are actually on the line today and we're presenters today. And I think that that is a first step that can be taken by anybody in the health system um, and getting decision makers, frontline workers, also operations uh, folks, but also clinical leaders on that organ on that advisory council is very important to figure out where you can prioritize. There are many ways to address things like climate change from food waste to energy use to transportation and, and keep going. So I think that figuring that out is um, is a great way. Having a group to help figure that out is a great way and to eventually promote the idea of having a sustainability assigned director or whatever it might be, which is how it came about at Metro Health as well. Yep. I, and, um... If, if you're in a healthcare facility that doesn't have a dedicated team, start a green team in your facility. Find some people interested in this topic and just start something. We operate green teams in our hospitals and family health centers in Northeast Ohio. They vary a bit in size and intensity, depending on sort of waning and waxing of interest in a different, but we do have that structure in place to support that across, across Northeast Ohio. But I'd start with just finding some other people interested, start a green team. In terms of the case for doing this work, Practice Green Help has some great tools to sort of make the case. But in general, it's young people entering the workforce have expectations that organizations are doing this of any kind, be they healthcare organizations or any other kind of manufacturing. Competition for jobs has never been fiercer. So I think this is a really important recruiting tool if you're talking to leaders in your organization. And then, you know, there's financial benefits to this. Certainly energy efficiency has saved Cleveland Clinic almost $100 million in the last 12 years. So there's parts of this that can impact the economic part of an organization's. So that's a part of the justification. And then there's a community health impact. So there's kind of different ways that depending on the leadership team and what they care about that you could pitch this to an organization if you're in one that does not have this kind of resource. Terrific words, um, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I've, I've been aware, you know, we've been having green teams locally in our in our clinical practices for the 20 plus years that I've been at Cleveland Clinic. And, and they're still in existence and they're still acting locally, but how, how much more powerful to have this umbrella of, of organizational energy um, to, to move things forward. Um, terrific work. Uh, I thank all of you for your efforts, for coming and joining us today. Um, and uh, look forward to our ongoing work together and, uh, and however we can continue to address these, these significant problems that we're all facing as, as human beings on planet Earth. Um, next slide, please. So finally, in our collaborative today, I'd like to take the opportunity to again introduce Chris Mundorf our Director of Data Analytics and Reporting uh, at Be Better Health Partnership. He's going to um, announce our Better Health Gold Stars, which is something we've been doing uh, as long as we've been having learning collaboratives. Um, I will give my own perspective on this about what a strange year it's been. It's of course, it's been more than a year that we've been uh, all uh, undergoing the effects of the pandemic. Um, this had an impact on patient care. This had an impact on the, the health of our patients. This had an impact on the health of our caregivers as well. Um, part of my work at Cleveland Clinic over the past year and a half has been in, in terms of managing the health of our, our caregivers who have been affected by COVID. Um, so all of these have, have combined in this perfect storm to uh, add to the the difficulty of making health improvements in our systems. Um, so I, I will say, Chris will tell you more about this, but what a great opportunity is it is to look at the larger picture of really what improvements have been made. How can we frame the health improvements in the time of COVID and really celebrate the work that's been done, which has been phenomenal. You know, we think back to the earlier discussion about um, the work that we did in terms of COVID testing, COVID vaccination throughout the community. Um, this has really, this has had an impact on all our areas of healthcare. And uh, it's hard to lift our heads from the work sometimes 
and take a moment to really recognize and celebrate. So I'm really grateful to Chris for putting this together. And Chris, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Donald. That was a really nice framing. Um, yeah, I think it's really important with this learning collaborative, you know, so much discussion is talking about, you know, the layers we're adding on to this quality improvement of, you know, racial and income disparities, uh, behavioral health, community engagement, climate change. And I think it was really important, you know, Dr. Boland's sort of talk at the very beginning of that core idea is that chronic disease measures. And I think that's, it's still so central to what we do. And I, as Dr. Ford described, I think that it really, it's so much hard work is being put into across all the systems, you know, in and out of our collaborative to really help, uh, you know, improve care for the patients across Northeast Ohio. Um, next slide. So as Donald described, you know, you know, traditionally our role uh, as a regional health improvement collaborative first started as, you know, as this effort to aggregate data across health systems and look for promising best practices across the region. And the tool that was used to identify those practices uh, early on and continues to today are these gold stars. These are um, uh, methods we use to highlight practices in the collaborative that are either showing tremendous improvement uh, year to year or uh, showing tremendous achievement in key metrics uh, that we selected as a collaborative, uh, metrics of colorectal cancer screening, the care of patients with diabetes, or the care of patients with high blood pressure. Um, next slide. So as an example, uh, our most recent report, uh, just at the, uh, as the pandemic was starting for 2020, um, these are two examples of gold stars that we found. And what I really love about the process is that, you know, the, it's really, um, it's blind to the size of the practice that we're not only able to find, you know, best practices at these large hospital systems, but we're really able to find best practices that are occurring in smaller practices, particularly federally qualified health centers that are disproportionately serving the low income and minority populations and doing a really amazing job of that. So on the left, uh, you know, as an example, we look at practices using data as a whole, their entire patient population. And so we see um, the red circle is the Akron practice for Asia Inc. Uh, serving in down uh, North Hill uh, of, uh, in the Akron neighborhoods, doing really, really well compared to the region and the care of patients with diabetes doing quite well. Additionally, on, on the right, so the example of how we look deeper in the data, we also look at the data broken down by the person's insurance. This really helps us to understand, you know, specifically looking at people who lack in health insurance, those that are on Medicaid, those are on Medicare, things like that. And the example that I wanted to highlight is, you know, looking at colorectal cancer screening among patients on Medicare, that the Superior Health Center associated with NEON serving, you know, you know, east side of Cleveland is getting a, an amazing 80% of its eligible Medicare patients screened for cancer, and it's higher than across the region. So really re remarkable work that we, you know, I, it's really sort of this, it's a pleasure whenever we disseminate these gold stars, because on the other end, it's usually these practices really doing hard, hard work that oftentimes isn't getting recognized. And when we are able to sort of disseminate these gold stars, it really sort of validates the work that they're doing behind the scenes. But as Donald described, this past year and a half has proved challenging uh, to do our typical gold stars. There's been a huge disruption as uh, Rita and I showed in several slides ago of people getting their, cons uh, their typical care. And then on a data side of being able to get consistent data that we're actually able to get a clear picture of gold stars. Yet, you know, so we wanted to do something to highlight the work that was done. And one way that we all settled on that we thought would be interesting would be to look back at all of our gold stars and see what we may able to tell about uh, the nature of sustained success. Because it's one thing to be able to show this high level of, of, of sort of success over a 12 month period, but what does it mean when a practice is able to do that year after year after year? And you know, how can, we, how can that in itself be a best practice? Next slide. So here are three examples that I think really kind of tell the story of what that means. So on the left, uh, you know, we look at high blood pressure, high blood pressure care, uh, you know, as a metric, and really consistently, I mean, year after year after year, you know, almost as long as we've been doing gold stars, the Sisters of Charity Health System, St. Vincent, has just really outperformed the region year after year, consistently, really, you know, you know, hitting that high level mark you know, time and time, you know, whatever turnover we might be talking about in terms of staff, providers, or patients, that they're able to hit those marks time and time again. 
In the dark blue, we have the Glenville Community Center out of Metro Health, formerly Jay Glenn. And they, when we look at uh, uh, colorectal cancer screening, consistently outperforming the region, you know, over the last five past years. And on the far right, we have an example in the Willoughby practice uh, that was once a part of the Lake Health System, now part of the university hospital systems. And over the last three years, six reports, they've been far outpacing the region in terms of di diabetes care. And in fact, this, this past report, they were their metrics were about 40% higher than the region as a whole. So not only in terms of consistently outperforming the region, but doing so at a very dramatic level. Uh, next slide. So looking at you know, other examples of these, I don't know, I, don't, I need to come up with a better name, reoccurring gold stars. I was surprised to find that, you know, there were a number of practices that have met this sustained high level of success over many years. In fact, we have over 20 practices apart across our Better Health Collaborative, really kind of hitting this mark of hitting these gold stars at 80% or more of the, the metrics they've, uh, they've uh, sent it in. These range from large practices like Bluey Stokes, Wade Park practice with the VA, the Metro Health main campus, to smaller uh, practices at, at FQHCs like the St. Clair Clinic at Care Alliance, the Detroit Shoreway Community Health Center at Neighborhood Family Practice. I look across this and I, I, you know, I know a lot of the providers that work through these practices. And it's, again, it's a major accomplishment when you consider how often the turnover looks in terms of losing staff, losing providers, and then also the changing demographics of which patients come to these practices. The fact that these practices have been able to sort of have sustained this high level of success over many years is a reflection of sort of that core culture that these systems and these practices sort of sustain. So hopefully as we move past the pandemic, we'll be able to get back uh, get back to uh, get, get people back to seeing their provider and use the gold stars to highlight the promising practices. But in the meantime, hopefully this analysis can help to rightly appraise the many men and women who have worked hard to achieve high levels of care and sustain that care over many years. And over the next few weeks, Better Health Partnership will be doing more to highlight these individual practices and releasing more data uh, and details over just how these sites were able to sustain these success. So I hope that uh, ends on a sort of a positive note, but again, it's, so much hard work is done behind the scenes and we wanted to make sure that we um, expressed our gratitude and the recognition to the, the, these practices and all the systems that are part of Better Health Partnership that have worked so hard to sustain high levels of care during this tough year, year and a half, goodness gracious. Thank you so much, Chris. I, I find that to be a tremendously positive note, um, even to take a moment to pause in our exhaustion uh, from, from this pandemic. Uh, to recognize each other, recognize the, the hard work that is being done, recognize the successes that we have. Thank you so much for delving into the data to find those, those uh, wonderful examples of success. Um, we've come to the end of our learning collaborative. Uh, we've had, I think, quite a journey today. Uh, we started with Dr. Bolin talking about um, the accomplishments and importance of our collaboration with a statewide organization addressing disparities um, across the state, learning from each other exactly as we do in Better Health Partnership, um, uh, learning how we can expand these efforts and be part of the larger whole. Our panel discussion about the Woodhill neighborhood transformation was, for me, transformational. Um, I, I can't tell you how, uh, how heartwarming and heartbreaking the conversation was to me um, to understand the need, but the efforts that are being put forward, um, pulling our community together, the, the tremendous spirit of, of all of our participants. And I think we all responded to Ms. Marilyn and, and her passion for the community and, and her dedication to her home. Um, let us be an example to the larger community of how we can institute change and make it sustainable. Um, the talk from Rita and Chris about the larger efforts of Better Health Partnership showing our extensive areas of collaboration, our partnerships, how we've relied on our, our partners to inform us of how we can do better across the system, how we've constructed groups to address the individual problems, 
drilling down from an understanding of, of the needs of the larger community to actual tools that we can use in our practices to make our care better, to fill those gaps um, and, and to include those who have historically not been included. Um, the work with COVID is, you know, something that we should be infinitely proud of. Um, the, we, I think we can, we can celebrate our own participation, but I think as we hopefully look forward to the end of this pandemic or, or to at least a, a way out of this pandemic, um, we know that we've contributed. We know that we've made a difference to, to uh, the most vulnerable in our communities. Um, the, the work of the adult leadership team, um, I, I find really impressive because what you did for us, Jim and Mimi, was you really broke down the process of, of how do we address these things um, from everything from how do we put a group together to how do we start to formulate an idea? How do we understand the problem? A problem so large as, as racial disparities in chronic disease management. Um, We've impacted it before in Better Health Partnership, and yet we've needed to take this step back as, as you are doing so diligently to try to really understand what's missing. Why haven't we sustained that? Why did we achieve those, those improvements, and yet we're not able to sustain them in the way that we think we should? Um, the whole discussion on, uh, on climate change and health Again, this is an example of a huge problem that's bigger than any of us in this, uh, in, in this Zoom meeting today. And yet people in our organizations, people in our communities are addressing these, starting to develop tools so that we can actually have an action about addressing this, this huge problem. Um, I thank everybody who participated today as a presenter, I thank everybody who stayed with us to listen in the audience. Uh, I thank those who all contributed uh, thoughts in the chat. And uh, I am really happy to leave this organization from this role on such a high note. Um, my heart is with you always. Uh, and, and I continue to collaborate in many, many ways. Um, I thank all of you for, for putting this work out and, and making such a difference in our community. Rita, any closing words from you? I could never say it more eloquently than you, Donald. <laughs> so I'm not going to try and take that place. But thank you for all the work you've done with Better Health Partnership over the years. And certainly anyone can see how well you emcee these events. And uh, I really don't know <laughs> who is going to fill those shoes. So thank you. But thank you to everybody. Phenomenal uh, collaboration today. And I really look forward to seeing you all in person next year. And of course, thanks for Carol for, for being the organizational spirit of this and, uh, and to our partners at Civitas as well for, for driving this through and, and, uh, uh, providing a safe and healthy environment for us to do this in. Um, I wish you all the best and have a beautiful weekend.